Chapter 108 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 108 how two beetles took lodgings once upon a time there was a worthy set of ants who lived together as happily as possible in their little town at the foot of a fine old oak tree they were honest peaceable folk and always did as the three queen ants who ruled over them told them to do the young men stayed quietly at home until it was time for them to get married and the young ladies who had nothing else to do did the same as for the working people but here's a curious state of things you'll never find a working man in an ant city as long as you live for all the workers are females even the soldiers you may take my word for that well as for these they were at it morning noon and night digging and building and fetching food for the whole town looking after the eggs of which there were so many you could never have counted them and seeing that all the baby ants were quite happy and comfortable now things would have gone on very well indeed if other people had only left these worthy ants alone but they did not and this is where my story really begins one fine day a set of ants belonging to quite another tribe came to the forest and built themselves a town not far from the first and these ants it grieves me to write it were far from peaceful and honest like their neighbors to tell the truth they were nothing more nor less than robbers they had not been very long in the place before their soldiers all women folk too made a raid on the town of the mild and harmless ants and carried off all the girl babies they could lay hands on and the moment the children were old enough to walk they were made into slaves and had to do all the roughest and hardest work well you may guess there was sorrow in the town of the peaceful ants they were too weak to fight their foes and so they just had to sit down and bear it as best they could now what happened once happened again and yet again till at last the harmless ants made up their minds to move and build themselves a new city in another part of the forest and so they did but it was all of no use for the robbers followed them and then the same thing happened all over again so soon as there was a fine fat promising bunch of girl babies in the town the robbers came and carried them into slavery one misfortune followed fast upon another not long after the ants had moved into their new town a beetle and his wife came stalking in and demanded lodgings in the queen's palace they were smartly dressed in blue and green coats of the latest cut but they carried no baggage except a toothbrush that stuck out of the beetle wife's pocket this was suspicious and they looked so hungry and thirsty into the bargain that it was not to be wondered at that the poor queen ant pulled a long face we are travelling for pleasure said the beetle's wife and we shall have much pleasure in staying here as long as we like with that she walked straight up to the best bedroom she said she hoped the sheets were aired and went to bed while her husband talked pleasantly with the three queens and ate three dozen new-laid ants eggs for his supper the unhappy queens soon saw what kind of visitors they had got the beetles made themselves at home everywhere in the palace and out of it and called for whatever they wanted the working ants had to wait on them hand and foot there was the beetle shaving water to be got first thing in the morning and the beetle's wife's cup of milk fresh from the cow for ants you must know keep their cows just as human beings do though the milk of the ant cow is more like sugar water than anything else we have 
then there never was any one who could do with so many meals in the course of a single day as that beetle and his wife they just ate and drank from morning to night and it was all the ants could do to keep the palace larder stocked all the choicest morsels the finest seeds and salads the workers could bring fell to the beetle's share while the queens got what was left there was no peace and quiet in the town the beetles pried into every hole and corner spread themselves in everybody's parlour and paraded the streets singing and whistling when quiet folks wanted to rest but what was worst of all they showed never a sign of moving on i thought you said you were travelling the bravest of the queens ventured to remark at last why so we were said the beetles but one must settle down some time or other and your air really suits us very well did you hear that whispered one young working ant to another the two had come to the palace with a pitcher of milk just in time to listen to the conversation they'll never leave us said the second ant not unless someone takes steps returned the first ant and pray whose steps and why asked the second you always were stupid said the first one and gave her waist a twitch which is a way ants have when they're put out now if someone were to take my advice she went on but there's nobody in all the town with two pennies worth of spirit nobody would take my advice i suppose you couldn't take it yourself asked the second aunt who really was not quite as stupid as people thought it never occurred to me said the first aunt but now you mention it perhaps i might and then the first aunt thought and thought and the end of it was that she slipped out of the town so soon as her day's work was finished and strolled away toward the town where the robber ants lived and presently a fierce old soldier ant came marching out at the gate then the little worker's heart beat very fast and she turned as pale as an ant can turn nothing venture nothing win she said to herself and walked straight up to the soldier hello who are you said the soldier oh i'm a neighbor of yours from beach town said the little ant i'm just taking a stroll before supper a stroll before supper cried the soldier staring very hard you don't seem to have much work to do over there why no i can't say i have said the little ant but i can see by your dress you're a servant said the soldier woman so i am said the little ant but we servants of beach town have an easy place a bit of dusting now and then and a little light needlework that's all i heard a very different story only the other day said the soldier ah but everything's changed since the beetles came said the little worker they do all the dirty work and my goodness they can work you may take my word for that it's worth something i can tell you to have two fine beetles like that in the town aha thought the soldier woman to herself here's something for us and she was so taken up with thinking that she forgot to bid the little ant good night and there and then she marched straight back to her town to tell the general what she had heard but the little ant went home well pleased with herself and sure enough what she expected would happen did happen the robber ants as soon as they heard the soldier's story were eager as possible to carry off the two beetles who could work so well and to prevent any fuss and bother this is what they did they took a great pitcher of ant cow's milk and mixed it with a few drops of the poison which as every one knows an ant always carries about with her in her poison bag then twelve soldiers took the pitcher to beach town and waited outside the gate for the beetles to come out and directly they saw them coming they put down the pitcher and hid behind a mountain of dead leaves but the beetles drank up the sweet stuff till there was not a drop left at the bottom of the pail and immediately the poison began to work and both the beetle and his wife fell back in a heap on to the grass and there they lay and could stir neither hand nor foot 
the robbers you may fancy lost no time bundled the pair on to a stout rhubarb leaf and dragged them away to their own city as fast as they could go now scarcely had they got them there when the poison began to wear off for ants poison is not very strong you see and pretty soon the beetle's wife sat up and pinched her husband it was not long before he sat up too and by and by those two were as clear in their heads and as firm on their legs as any two beetles ever were and now there was an unpleasant surprise in store for the robber ants when the beetle's wife had looked around a bit she said to her husband why it seems comfortable enough here i don't think we'll trouble to go back to beach town i think this will suit us very well 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 we'll just see what the cooking's like said he and went straight to the palace where the six queen ants who ruled over the robbers lived he just said how do you do to the queens in an off-hand way and then he sat down and helped himself to all the dishes he could find in the larder his wife she did the same and between them they finished all the food there was and so they went on just as they were used to doing in beach town and it did not take the robbers long to find out the mistake they had made the beetles had never done a day's work in their lives and they had no notion of beginning now just because the robbers expected it when they heard how they had been carried off and why they thought the whole affair a very good joke and laughed and laughed till they grew purple in the face and had to slap each other on the back to keep from choking the robbers you may believe me were as angry as angry could be they coaxed and they threatened but neither the beetle nor his wife would do a stroke of work on the contrary they took such a deal of waiting upon that the robbers were driven well nigh crazy and racked their brains for a way to get rid of them but the beetles liked their new quarters very well and there they stopped so things went on till at last the robbers made up their minds to give the beetles the slip and one dark night while they were asleep they packed their trunks and left the town but the gate wanted oiling and creaked so as they swung it open that the beetle's wife got nightmare and woke up in a minute you may be sure she had found out what was going on and had wakened her husband then the two crept very softly out at the gate and kept the ants at a comfortable distance so the end of it all was that though the robbers went far into the forest many leagues from their old town they had no sooner finished building the new one than in marched the beetles and went on in their old way as though nothing had happened now the robbers had settled so far away from beach town that it was not worth their while to come and steal children of the harmless ants for they found another town nearer to hand and so the harmless ants lived together quite happily and peacefully once more and the clever little worker to whom they owed their good fortune was raised to great honour and glory but the robbers had to make the best of the beetles for get rid of them they never could and if you ever should be passing that way why i make no doubt you'll find them there still end of chapter 108「hundred and nine of Tales of Laughter」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pat Mathewson, England. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 109 Little Tuppen. One day, an old hen whose name was Cluck Cluck went into the woods with her little chick Tuppen to get some blueberries to eat. But a berry stuck fast in the little one's throat, and he fell upon the ground, choking and gasping. Cluck Cluck, in great fright, ran to fetch some water for him. She ran to the spring and said, My dear spring, please give me some water. I want it for my little chick Tuppen who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The spring said, 
I will give you some water if you will bring me a cup. Then Cluck Cluck ran to the oak tree and said, Dear oak tree, please give me a cup. I want it for the spring. And then the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The oak tree said, I will give you a cup if someone will shake my branches. Then Cluck Cluck ran to Maid Marian, the woodcutter's child, and said, Dear Maid Marian, please shake the oak tree's branches, and then the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring, and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The woodcutter's child, Maid Marian, said, I will shake the oak tree's branches if you will give me some shoes. Then Cluck Cluck ran to the shoemaker and said, Dear shoemaker, please give me some shoes. I want them for Maid Marian, the woodcutter's child. For then Maid Marian will shake the oak tree's branches, and the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring, and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The shoemaker said, I will give you some shoes if you will give me some leather. Then Cluck Cluck ran to Moo Moo the ox and said, Dear Moo Moo, please give me some leather. I want it for the shoemaker. For then the shoemaker will give me some shoes and I will give the shoes to Maid Marian. And Maid Marian will shake the oak tree's branches and the oak tree will give me a cup and I will give the cup to the spring and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The ox, Moo Moo, said, I will give you some leather if you will give me some corn. Then Cluck Cluck ran to the farmer and said, Dear farmer, please give me some corn. I want it for Moo Moo the ox, for then the ox will give me some leather, and I will give the leather to the shoemaker. And the shoemaker will give me shoes, and I will give the shoes to Maid Marian, and Maid Marian will shake the oak tree's branches, and the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring, and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The farmer said, I will give you some corn if you will give me a plough. Then Cluck Cluck ran to the blacksmith and said, Dear blacksmith, please give me a plough. I want it for the farmer, for then the farmer will give me some corn, and I will give the corn to the ox, and the ox will give me leather, and I will give the leather to the shoemaker, and the shoemaker will give me shoes, and I will give the shoes to Maid Marian, and Maid Marian will shake the oak tree's branches, and the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring, and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The blacksmith said, I will give you a plough if you will give me some iron. Then Cluck Cluck ran to the busy little dwarfs who live under the mountains and have all the iron that is found in the mines. Dear, dear dwarf, she said, please give me some of your iron. I want it for the blacksmith. For then the blacksmith will give me a plough and I will give the plough to the farmer and the farmer will give me corn and I will give the corn to the ox, and the ox will give me leather, and I will give the leather to the shoemaker, and the shoemaker will give me shoes, and I will give the shoes to Maid Marian, and Maid Marian will shake the oak tree's branches, and the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring, and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The little dwarfs who live under the mountains had pity on poor Cluck Cluck, and they gave her a great heap of red iron ore from their mines. Then she gave the iron to the blacksmith, and the plough to the farmer, and the corn to the ox, and the leather to the shoemaker, and the shoes to Maid Marian, and Maid Marian shook the oak tree, and the spring got the acorn cup, and Cluck Cluck carried it full of water to her little chick Tuppen. Then little Tuppen drank the water, and was well again, and ran chirping and singing in the long grass, as if nothing had happened to him. End of chapter 109 Chapter 110 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. The Story of the Four Little Children Who Went Round the World. Once upon a time, a long while ago, there were four little people whose names were Violet, Slingsby, Guy, and Lionel, and they all thought they should like to see the world, so they bought a large boat to sail quite round the world by sea, and then they were to come back on the other side by land. The boat was painted blue with green spots, and the sail was yellow with red stripes, and when they set off, they only took a small cat to steer and look after the boat, besides an elderly quangle-wangle, who had to cook the dinner and make the tea, for which purposes they took a large kettle. For the first ten days they sailed on beautifully, and found plenty to eat, as there were lots of fish, and they had only to take them out of the sea with a long spoon, when the quangle-wangle instantly cooked them, and the pussy-cat was fed with the bones, with which she expressed herself pleased on the whole, so that all the party was very happy. During the daytime Violet chiefly occupied herself in putting salt water into a churn, while her three brothers churned it violently in the hope that it would turn into butter, which it seldom, if ever, did, and in the evening they all retired into the tea kettle, where they all managed to sleep very comfortably, while Pussy and the Quangle Wangle managed the boat. After a time they saw some land at a distance, and when they came to it, they found it was an island made of water quite surrounded by earth. Besides that, it was bordered by evanescent isthmuses, with a great gulf stream running all over it, so that it was perfectly beautiful and contained only a single tree, five hundred and three feet high. When they had landed, they walked about, but found, to their great surprise, that the island was quite full of veal cutlets and chocolate drops, and nothing else. So they all climbed up the single high tree to discover, if possible, if there were any people. But having remained on the top of the tree for a week, and not seeing anybody, they naturally concluded that there were no inhabitants, and accordingly, when they came down, they loaded the boat with two thousand veal cutlets and a million of chocolate drops, and these afforded them sustenance for more than a month, during which time they pursued their voyage with the utmost delight and apathy. After this they came to a shore where there were no less than sixty-five great red parrots with blue tails, sitting on a rail all in a row and all fast asleep, and I am sorry to say that the pussy-cat and the quangle-wangle crept softly, and bit off the tail-feathers of all the sixty-five parrots, for which Violet reproved them most severely, notwithstanding which she proceeded to insert all the feathers, two hundred and sixty in number, in her bonnet, thereby causing it to have a lovely and glittering appearance, highly prepossessing and efficacious. The next thing that happened to them was in a narrow part of the sea, which was so entirely full of fishes that the boat could not go on no farther, so they remained there about six weeks, till they had eaten nearly all the fishes, which were soles, and all readily cooked and covered with shrimp sauce, so there was no trouble whatever. And as the few fishes who remained uneaten complained of the cold, 
as well as of the difficulty they had in getting any sleep on account of the extreme noise made by the arctic bears and the tropical turnspits which frequented the neighborhood in great numbers violet most amiably knitted a small woolen frock for several of the fishes and slingsby administered some opium drops to them through which kindness they became quite warm and slept soundly then they came to a country which was wholly covered with immense orange trees of a vast size and quite full of fruit so they all landed taking with them the tea kettle intending to gather some of the oranges and place them in it but while they were busy about this a most dreadfully high wind rose and blew out most of the parrot tail feathers from violet's bonnet that however was nothing compared with the calamity of the oranges falling down on their heads by millions and millions which thumped and bumped and bumped and thumped them all so seriously that they were obliged to run as hard as they could for their lives besides that the sound of the oranges rattling on the tea kettle was of the most fearful and amazing nature nevertheless they got safely to the boat although considerably vexed and hurt and the quangle wangle's right foot was so knocked about that he had to sit with his head in his slipper for at least a week this event made them all for a time rather melancholy and perhaps they might never have become less so had not lionel with a most praiseworthy devotion and perseverance continued to stand on one leg and whistled to them in a loud and lively manner which diverted the whole party so extremely that they gradually recovered their spirits and agreed that whenever they should reach home they would subscribe toward a testimonial to lionel entirely made of gingerbread and raspberries as an earnest token of their sincere and grateful infection after sailing on calmly for several more days they came to another country where they were much pleased and surprised to see a countless multitude of white mice with red eyes all sitting in a great circle slowly eating custard pudding with the most satisfactory and polite demeanor and as the four travelers were rather hungry being tired of eating nothing but soles and oranges for so long a period they held a council as to the propriety of asking the mice for some of their pudding in a humble and affecting manner by which they could hardly be otherwise than gratified it was agreed therefore that guy should go and ask the mice which he immediately did and the result was that they gave a walnut shell only half full of custard diluted with water now this displeased guy who said out of such a lot of pudding as you have got i must say you might have spared a somewhat larger quantity but no sooner had he finished speaking than the mice turned round at once and sneezed at him in an appalling and vindictive manner and it is impossible to imagine a more scrupulous and unpleasant sound than that caused by the simultaneous sneezing of many millions of angry mice so that guy rushed back to the boat having first shied his cap in the middle of the custard pudding by which means he completely spoiled the mice's dinner by and by the four children came to a country where there were no houses but only an incredibly innumerable number of large bottles without corks and of a dazzling and sweetly susceptible blue color each of these blue bottles contained a blue bottle fly and all these interesting animals lived continually together 
in the most copious and rural harmony nor perhaps in many parts of the world is such perfect and abject happiness to be found violet and slingsby and guy and lionel were greatly struck with this singular and instructive settlement and having previously asked permission of the blue bottle flies which was most courteously granted the boat was drawn up to the shore and they proceeded to make tea in front of the bottles but as they had no tea leaves they merely placed some pebbles in the hot water and the quangle wangle played some tunes over it on an accordion by which of course tea was made directly and of the very best quality the four children then entered into conversation with the blue-bottle flies who discoursed in a placid and genteel manner though with a slightly buzzing accent chiefly owing to the fact that they each held a small clothes-brush between their teeth which naturally occasioned a fizzy extraneous utterance why said violet would you kindly inform us do you reside in bottles and if in bottles at all why not rather in green or purple or indeed in yellow bottles to which questions a very aged blue bottle fly answered we found the bottles here all ready to live in that is to say our great 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 grandfathers did so we occupied them at once and when the winter comes on we turn the bottles upside down and consequently rarely feel the cold at all and you know very well that this could not be the case with bottles of any other color than blue of course it could not said slingsby but if we may take the liberty of inquiring on what do you chiefly subsist mainly on oyster patties said the blue bottle fly and when these are scarce on raspberry vinegar and russian leather boiled down to a jelly how delicious said guy to which lionel added huzz and all the blue bottle flies said buzz at this time an elderly fly said it was the hour for the evening song to be sung and on a signal being given all the blue bottle flies began to buzz at once in a sumptuous and sonorous manner the melodious and mucilaginous sounds echoing all over the waters and resounding across the tumultuous tops of the transitory tumultuous upon the intervening and verdant mountains which a serene and sickly solvity only known to the truly virtuous the moon was shining sublaciously from the star-bespangled sky while her light irrigated the smooth and shiny sides and wings and backs of the blue-bottle flies with a peculiar and trivial splendor while all nature cheerfully responded to the cerulean and conspicuous circumstances in many long after years the four little travellers looked back to that evening as one of the happiest in all their lives and it was already past midnight when the sail of the boat having been set up by the quangle wangle the tea-kettle and churn placed in their respective positions and the pussy-cat stationed at the helm the children each took a last and affectionate farewell of the blue blotto flies who walked down in a body to the water's edge to see the travellers embark as a token of parting respect and esteem violet made a curtsey quite down to the ground and stuck one of her few remaining parrot tail feathers into the back hair of the most pleasing of the blue bottle flies while slingsby guy and lionel offered them three small boxes containing respectively black pins dried figs and epsom salts 
and thus they left the happy shore forever overcome by their feelings the four little travellers instantly jumped into the tea kettle and fell fast asleep but all along the shore for many hours there was distinctly heard a sound of severely suppressed sobs and of a vague multitude of living creatures using their pocket handkerchiefs in a subdued simultaneous snuffle lingering sadly along the walloping waves as the boat sailed farther and farther away from the land of the happy bluebottle flies nothing particular occurred for some days after these events except that as the travellers were passing a low tract of sand they perceived an unusual and gratifying spectacle namely a large number of crabs and crawfish perhaps six or seven hundred sitting by the waterside and endeavouring to disentangle a vast heap of pale pink worsted which they moistened at intervals with fluid composed of lavender water and white wine negus can we be of any service to you o crusty crabbies said the four children thank you kindly said the crabs consecutively we are trying to make some worsted mittens but do not know how on which violet who was perfectly acquainted with the art of mitten making said to the crabs do your claws unscrew or are they fixtures they are all made to unscrew said the crabs and forthwith they deposited a great pile of claws close to the boat with which violet combed all the pale pink worsted and then made the loveliest mittens with it you can imagine these the crabs having resumed and screwed on their claws placed cheerfully upon their wrists and walked away rapidly on their hind legs warbling songs with a silvery voice and in a minor key after this the four little people sailed on again till they came to a vast and wide plain of astonishing dimensions on which nothing whatever could be discovered at first but as the travellers walked onward they appeared in the extreme and dim distance a single object which on a nearer approach and on an accurately cutaneous inspection seemed to be somebody in a large white wig sitting on an armchair made of sponge cakes and oyster shells it does not quite look like a human being said violet doubtfully nor could they make out what it really was till the quangle wangle who had previously been round the world exclaimed softly in a loud voice it is the cooperative cauliflower and so in truth it was and they soon found that what they had taken for an immense wig was in reality the top of the cauliflower and that he had no feet at all being able to walk tolerably well with a fluctuating and graceful movement on a single cabbage stalk an accomplishment which naturally saved him the expense of stockings and shoes presently while the whole party from the boat was gazing at him with mingled affection and disgust he suddenly arose and in a somewhat plumdopious manner hurried off toward the setting sun his steps supported by two superincumbent confidential cucumbers and a large number of water wagtails proceeding in advance of him by three and three in a row till he finally disappeared on the brink of the western sky in a crystal cloud of sodorphic sand so remarkable a sight of course impressed the four children very deeply and they returned immediately to their boat 
with a strong sense of undeveloped asthma and a great appetite shortly after this the travellers were obliged to sail directly below some high overhanging rocks from the top of one of which a particularly odious little boy dressed in rose-coloured knickerbockers and with a pewter plate upon his head threw an enormous pumpkin at the boat by which it was instantly upset but this upsetting was of no consequence because all the party knew how to swim very well and in fact they preferred swimming about till after the moon rose when the water growing chilly they spontaneously entered the boat meanwhile the quangle wangle threw back the pumpkin with immense force so that it hit the rocks where the malicious little boy in rose-coloured knickerbockers was sitting when being quite full of lufacer matches the pumpkin exploded surreptitiously into a thousand bits whereupon the rocks instantly took fire and the odious little boy became unpleasantly hotter and hotter and hotter till his knickerbockers were turned quite green and his nose was burned off two or three days after this happened they came to another place where they found nothing at all except some wide and deep pits full of mulberry jam this is the property of the tiny yellow-nosed apes who abound in these districts and who store up the mulberry jam for their food in winter when they mix it with pellucid pale periwinkle soup and serve it out in wedgewood china bowls which grow freely all over that part of the country only one of the yellow-nosed apes was on the spot and he was fast asleep yet the four travellers and the quadrangle and the pussy were so terrified by the violence and the sanguinity sound of his snoring that they merely took a small cupful of the jam and returned to re-embark in their boat without delay what was their horror on seeing the boat including the churn and the sea kettle in the mouth of an enormous sea's prider an aquatic and ferocious creature truly dreadful to behold and happily not only met with in those excessive longitudes in a moment the beautiful boat was bitten into fifty thousand million hundred billion bits and it instantly became quite clear that violet slingsby guy and lionel could no longer premulate their voyage by sea the four travellers were therefore obliged to resolve on pursuing their wanderings by land and very fortunately there happened to pass by at that moment an elderly rhinoceros on which they seized and all four mounting on their back the quadrangle sitting on his horn and holding on by his ears and the pussy-cat swinging at the end of his tail they set off having only four small beans and three pounds of mashed potatoes to last through their whole journey they were however able to catch numbers of the chickens and turkeys and other birds who incessantly alighted on the head of the rhinoceros for the purpose of gathering the seeds of the rhododendron plants which grew there and these creatures they cooked in the most translucent and satisfactory manner by means of a fire lighted on the end of the rhinoceros's back a crowd of kangaroos and gigantic cranes accompanied them from feelings of curiosity and complacency so that they were never at a loss for company and went onward as it were 
in sort of a profuse and triumphant procession thus in less than eighteen weeks they all arrived safely at home where they were received by their admiring relatives with joy tempered with contempt and where they finally resolved to carry out the rest of their travelling plans at some more favourable opportunity as for the rhinoceros in token of their grateful adherence they had him killed and stuffed directly and then set him up outside the door of their father's house as a diaphanous door scraper end of chapter a hundred and ten recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter one hundred eleven of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter one hundred eleven the history of the seven families of the lake pipple popple from nonsense stories chapter one introductory in former days that is to say once upon a time there lived in the land of gramble blamble seven families they lived by the side of the great lake pipple popple one of the seven families indeed lived in the lake and on the outskirts of the city of tosh which excepting when it was quite dark they could see plainly the names of all these places you have probably heard of and you have only not to look in your geography books to find out all about them now the seven families who lived on the borders of the great lake pipple popple were as follows in the next chapter chapter two the seven families there was a family of two old parrots and seven young parrots there was a family of two old storks and seven young storks there was a family of two old geese and seven young geese there was a family of two old owls and seven young owls there was a family of two old guinea pigs and seven young guinea pigs there was a family of two old cats and seven young cats and there was a family of two old fishes and seven young fishes chapter three the habits of the seven families the parrots lived upon the sofsky pofsky trees which were beautiful to behold and covered with blue leaves and they fed upon fruit artichokes and striped beetles the storks walked in and out of the lake pipple popple and ate frogs for breakfast and buttered toast for tea but on account of the extreme length of their legs they could not sit down and so they walked about continually the geese having webs to their feet caught quantities of flies which they ate for dinner the owls anxiously looked after mice which they caught and made into sago puddings. The guinea pigs toddled about the gardens and ate lettuces and Cheshire cheese. The cats sat still in the sunshine and fed upon sponge biscuits. The fishes lived in the lake and fed chiefly on boiled periwinkles. And all these seven families lived together in the utmost fun and felicity. Chapter 4 The Children of the Seven Families Are Sent Away one day all the seven fathers and the seven mothers of the seven families agreed that they would send their children out to see the world so they called them all together and gave them each eight shillings and some good advice some chocolate drops and a small green morocco pocket-book to set down their expenses in they then particularly entreated them not to quarrel and all the parents sent off their children with a parting injunction if said the old parrots you find a cherry do not fight about who should have it and said the old storks if you find a frog divide it carefully into seven bits but on no account quarrel about it and the old geese said to the seven young geese whatever you do be sure you do not touch a plum pudding flea and the old owl said if you find a mouse tear him up into seven slices and eat him cheerfully but without quarrelling and the old guinea pig said have a care that you eat your lettuces 
should you find any not greedily but calmly and the old cat said be particularly careful not to meddle with a clangle wangle if you should see one and the old fishes said above all things avoid eating a blue boss was for they do not agree with fishes and give them a pain in their toes so all the children of each family thanked their parents and making in all forty-nine polite bows they went into the wide world chapter five the history of the seven young parrots the seven young parrots had not gone far when they saw a tree with a single cherry on it which the oldest parrot picked instantly but the other six being extremely hungry tried to get it also on which all the seven began to fight and they scuffled and huffled and ruffled and shuffled and puffled and muffled and buffled and duffled and fluffled and guffled and bruffled and screamed and shrieked and squealed and squeaked and clawed and snapped and bit and bumped and thumped and dumped and flumped each other till they were all torn into little bits and at last there was nothing left to record this painful incident except the cherry and seven small green feathers and that was the vicious and voluble end of the seven young parrots chapter six the history of the seven young storks when the seven young storks set out they walked or flew for fourteen weeks in a straight line and for six weeks more in a crooked one and after that they ran as hard as they could for one hundred and eight miles and after that they stood still and made a himmeltaneous clatter clatter blattery noise with their bills about the same time they perceived a large frog spotted with green and with a sky-blue stripe under each ear so being hungry they immediately flew at him and were going to divide him into seven pieces when they began to quarrel as to which of his legs should be taken off first one said this and another said that and while they were all quarrelling the frog hopped away and when they saw that he was gone they began to chatter clatter bladder platter patter bladder matter clatter flatter quatter more violently than ever and after they had fought for a week they pecked each other all to little pieces so that at last nothing was left of any of them except their bills and that was the end of the seven young storks chapter seven the history of the seven young geese when the seven young geese began to travel they went over a large plain on which there was but one tree and that was a very bad one so four of them went up to the top of it and looked about them while the other three waddled up and down and repeated poetry and their last six lessons in arithmetic geography and cookery presently they perceived a long way off an object of the most interesting and obese appearance having a perfectly round body exactly resembling a boiled plum pudding with two little wings and a beak and three feathers growing out of his head and only one leg so after a time all the seven young geese said to each other beyond all doubt this beast must be a plum pudding flea on which they incautiously began to sing aloud plum pudding flea plum pudding flea wherever you be oh come to our tree and listen oh listen oh listen to me and no sooner had they sung this verse than the plum pudding flea began to hop and skip on his one leg with the most dreadful velocity and came straight to the tree where he stopped and looked about him in a vacant and voluminous manner on which the seven young geese were greatly alarmed and all of a tremble bemble so one of them put out his long neck and just touched him with the tip of his bill but no sooner had he done this than the plum pudding flea skipped and hopped about more and more and higher and higher after which he opened his mouth and to the great surprise and indignation of the seven geese began to bark so loudly and furiously and terribly that they were totally unable to bear the noise and by degrees every one of them suddenly tumbled down quite dead so that was the end of the seven young geese chapter eight the history of the seven young owls when the seven young owls set out they sat every now and then on the branches of old trees 
and never went far at one time and one night when it was quite dark they thought they heard a mouse but as the gas lamps were not lighted they could not see him so they called out is that a mouse on which a mouse answered squeaky peaky weeky yes it is and immediately all the young owls threw themselves off the tree meaning to alight on the ground but they did not perceive that there was a large well below them into which they all fell superficially and were every one of them drowned in less than half a minute so that was the end of the seven young owls chapter nine the history of the seven young guinea pigs the seven young guinea pigs went into a garden full of gooseberry bushes and tiggery trees under one of which they fell asleep when they awoke they saw a large lettuce which had grown out of the ground while they had been sleeping and which had an immense number of green leaves at which they all exclaimed lettuce oh lettuce let us oh let us oh lettuce leaves oh let us leave this tree and eat lettuce oh let us lettuce leaves and instantly the seven young guinea pigs rushed with such extreme force against the lettuce plant and hit their heads so vividly against its stalk that the concussion brought on directly an incipient transitional inflammation of their noses which grew worse and worse and worse and worse till it accidentally killed them all seven and that was the end of the seven young guinea pigs chapter ten the history of the seven young cats the seven young cats set off on their travels with great delight and rapacity but on coming to the top of a high hill they perceived at a long distance off a clangle wangle or as it is more properly written clangel wangel and in spite of the warning they had had they ran straight up to it now the clangle wangles are most dangerous and delusive beasts and by no means commonly to be met with they live in the water as well as on land using their long tails as a sail when in the former element their speed is extreme but their habits of life are domestic and superfluous and their general demeanour pensive and pellucid on summer evenings they may sometimes be observed near the lake pipple standing on their heads and humming their national melodies they subsist entirely on vegetables excepting when they eat veal or mutton or pork or beef or fish or saltpetre the moment the clangle wangle saw the seven young cats approach he ran away and as he ran straight on for four months and the cats though they continued to run could never overtake him they all gradually died of fatigue and exhaustion and never afterward recovered and this was the end of the seven young cats chapter eleven the history of the seven young fishes the seven young fishes swam across the lake pipple and into the river and into the ocean where most unhappily for them they saw on the fifteenth day of their travels a bright blue boss and instantly swam after him but the blue boss plunged into a perpendicular speculiar orbicular quadrangular circular depth of soft mud where in fact his house was and the seven young fishes swimming with great and uncomfortable velocity plunged also into the mud quite against their will and not being accustomed to it were all suffocated in a very short time and that was the end of the seven young fishes chapter twelve of what occurred subsequently after it was known that the seven young parrots and the seven young storks and the seven young geese and the seven young owls and the seven young guinea pigs and the seven young cats and the seven young fishes were all dead then the frog and the plum pudding flea and the mouse and the clangle wangle and the blue boss was all met together to rejoice over their good fortune and they collected the seven feathers of the seven young parrots and the seven bills of the seven young storks and the lettuce and the cherry and having placed the latter on the lettuce and the other objects in a circular arrangement at their base they danced a hornpipe round all these memorials until they were quite tired after which they gave a tea party and a garden party and a ball and a concert and then returned to their respective homes full of joy and respect sympathy satisfaction and disgust
Chapter Thirteen of what became of the parents of the forty-nine children but when the two old parrots and the two old storks and the two old geese and the two old owls and the two old guinea pigs and the two old cats and the two old fishes became aware by reading in the newspapers of the calamitous extinction of the whole of their families they refused all further sustenance and sending out to various shops they purchased great quantities of cayenne pepper and brandy and vinegar and blue sealing wax besides seven immense glass bottles with air-tight stoppers and having done this they ate a light supper of brown bread and jerusalem artichokes and took an affecting and formal leave of the whole of their acquaintance which was very numerous and distinguished and select and responsible and ridiculous chapter fourteen conclusion and after this they filled the bottles with the ingredients for pickling and each couple jumped into a separate bottle by which effort of course they all died immediately and became thoroughly pickled in a few minutes having previously made their wills by the assistance of the most eminent lawyers of the district in which they left strict orders that the stoppers of the seven bottles should be carefully sealed up with the blue sealing wax they had purchased and that they themselves in the bottles should be presented to the principal museum of the city of tosh to be labelled with parchment or any other anti-congenial succedaneum and to be placed on a marble table with silver gilt legs for the daily inspection and contemplation and for the perpetual benefit of the pusillanimous public and if you ever happen to go to gramble blamble and visit that museum in the city of tosh look for them on the ninety-eighth table in the four hundred and twenty-seventh room of the right-hand corridor of the left wing of the central quadrangle of that magnificent building for if you do not you certainly will not see them edward lear end of chapter one hundred eleven Chapter number a hundred and twelve of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. We Robin's Yule Song. There was an odd grey pussy bodrons, and she got away down by a water slide, and there she saw a wee robin redbreast hoppin on a briar, and pussy bodrons says, "Where's ta gone, wee robin?" And wee robin says, "I'm gone away to the king to sing him a sang this gid yule morning," and pussy bodrons says. Come here, wee robin, and I'll let you see a bonny white ring round my neck. But wee robin says, Na, na, grey pussy bodrons, na, na, ye worry the wee mousie, but ye see not worry me. So wee robin flew away till he came to a fail fod dyke, turf wall, and there he saw a grey greedy gled, hawk, sitting and grey greedy gled says where's to ga wee robin and wee robin says i'm gone away to the king to sing him a sang this gid yule morning and grey greedy gled says come here wee robin and i'll let ye see a bonny feather in my wing but wee robin says na na grey greedy gled na na Ye pocket, pecked, a thee we linty, but ye see no pook me. So wee robin flew away till he came to the clutch, hollow, o a craig, and there he saw slee Todd Lowry, sly fox, sitting, and slee Todd Lowry says, Where to gone, we robin? And wee robin says, I'm gone away to the king to sing him a song 
this guild you mourning, and see Todd Lowry says, Come here, wee Robin, and I'll let ye see a bonny spot on the tap of my tail. But wee Robin says, Na na, slee Todd Lowry, na na, ye worry the wee lammy, but ye see no worry me. So wee Robin flew away till he came to a bonny burnside, and there he saw a wee callant sitting, and the wee callant says, where to gone, wee Robin? And wee Robin says, I'm gone away to the king to sing him a sang, this gid you'll mourning. And the wee callant says, Come here, wee Robin, and I'll gie you a ween grand moulins, crumbs, out of my pooch. But wee Robin says, Na na, wee callant, na na, ye speldert, knock down, the gold pink goldfinch but ye see no spelder me so wee robin flew away till he came to the king and there he sat on a winnock sole ploughshare and sang the king a bonny sang and the king says to the queen what will ye gee to wee robin for singing us this bonny sang and the queen says to the king I think we'll gee him the wee ran to be his wife. So wee Robin and the wee ran were married, and the king and the queen and the court danced at the wedding. Sin he flew away home to an waterslide, and hop it on a brier. Attributed to Robert Burns. End of chapter 112. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver. BC. Chapter number 113 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin The Giant's Shoes Once upon a time there was a large giant who lived in a small castle. At least he didn't all of him live there, but he managed things in this wise. From his earliest youth up his legs had been of a superstitiously small size unsuited to the rest of his body, so he sat upon the southwest wall of the castle with his legs inside, and his right foot came out of the east gate, and his left foot out of the north gate, while his gloomy but spacious coattails covered up the south and west gates, and in this way the castle was defended against all comers, and was deemed impregnable by the military authorities. This, however, as we shall soon see, was not the case, for the giant's boots were inside as well as his legs, but, as he had neglected to put them on in the giddy days of his youth, he was never afterward able to do so, because there was not enough room, and in this bootless but compact manner he passed his time. The giant slept for three weeks at a time, and two days after he woke his breakfast was brought to him, consisting of bright brown horses sprinkled on his bread and butter. Besides his boots, the giant had a pair of shoes, and in one of them his wife lived when she was at home. On other occasions she lived in the other shoe. She was a sensible, practical kind of woman with two wooden legs and a clothes horse, but in other respects not rich. The wooden legs were kept pointed at the end in order that, if the giant were dissatisfied with his breakfast, he might pick up any stray people that were within reach, using his wife as a fork. This annoyed the inhabitants of the district, so that they built their church in a southwestern direction from the castle, behind the giant's back that he might not be able to pick them up as they went in. But those who stayed outside to play pitch and toss were exposed to great danger and sufferings. 
now in the village there were two brothers of altogether different tastes and dispositions and talents and peculiarities and accomplishments and in this way they were discovered not to be the same person the elder of them was most marvelously good at singing and could sing the old hundredth and old hundred times without stopping whenever he did this he stood on one leg and tied the other round his neck to avoid catching cold and spoiling his voice but the neighbors fled and he was also a rare hand at making guava dumplings out of three cats and a shoehorn which is an accomplishment seldom met with but his brother was more meagre melanguous person and his chief accomplishment was to eat a wagon load of hay overnight and wake up thatched in the morning the whole interest of this story depends upon the fact that the giant's wife's clothes horse broke in consequence of a sudden thaw being made of organ pipes so she took off her wooden legs and stuck them in the ground tying a string from the top of one to the top of the other and hung out her clothes to dry on that now this was astutely remarked by the two brothers who therefore went up in front of the giant after he had his breakfast the giant called out fork fork but his wife trembling hid herself in the more recondite toe of the second shoe then the singing brother began to sing but he had not taken into account the pious disposition of the giant who instantly joined in the psalm and this caused the singing brother to burst his head off but as it was tied by the leg he did not lose it altogether but the other brother being well thatched on account of the quantity of hay he had eaten overnight lay down between the great toe of the giant and the next and wriggled so the giant being unable to bear tickling in the feet kicked out in an orthopedical manner whereupon the castle broke and he fell backward and was impaled upon the sharp steeple of the church so they put a label on him on which was written nupes gigantens that's all william clingdon clifford end of chapter 113 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter 114 of tales of laughter this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 114. The Farmer and the Money Lender. There was once a farmer who suffered much at the hands of a money lender. Good harvests or bad, the farmer was always poor, the money lender rich. At the last, when he hadn't a farthing left, the farmer went to the money-lender's house and said, You can't squeeze water from a stone, and as you have nothing to get by me now, you might tell me the secret of becoming rich. My friend, returned the money-lender piously, riches come from Ram. Ask him. Thank you, I will, replied the simple farmer, so he prepared three girdle cakes to last him on the journey and set out to find Ram. First he met a Brahmin, and to him he gave a cake, asking him to point out the road to Ram. But the Brahmin only took the cake and went on his way without a word. Next the farmer met a yogi, or devotee, and to him he gave a cake, without receiving any help in return. At last he came upon a poor man sitting under a tree, and finding out he was hungry, the kindly farmer gave him his last cake, and sitting down to rest beside him, entered into conversation. "'And where are you going?' asked the poor man at length. "'Oh, I have a long journey before me, for I am going to find Ram,' replied the farmer. "'I don't suppose you could tell me which way to go.' "'Perhaps I can,' said the poor man, smiling, "'for I am Ram. What do you want of me?' Then the farmer told the whole story, and Ram, taking pity on him, gave him a conch shell and showed him how to blow it in a particular way, saying, "Remember." Whatever you wish for, you have only to blow the conch that way, and your wish will be fulfilled. 
Only have a care of that money lender, for even magic is not proof against his wiles. The farmer went back to his village rejoicing. In fact, the money lender noticed his high spirits at once and said to himself, Some good fortune must have befallen the stupid fellow to make him hold his head so jauntily. Therefore he went over to the simple farmer's house and congratulated him on his good fortune in such cunning words, pretending to have heard all about it, that before long the farmer found himself telling the whole story, all except the secret of blowing the conch, for with all his simplicity the farmer was not quite such a fool as to tell that. Nevertheless, the money lender determined to have the conch by hook or by crook, and as he was villain enough not to stick at trifles, he waited for a favorable opportunity and stole the conch. But, after nearly bursting himself with blowing the conch in every conceivable way, he was obliged to give up the secret as a bad job. However, being determined to succeed, he went back to the farmer and said coolly, Look here, I've got your conch, but I can't use it. You haven't got it, so it's clear you can't use it either. Business is at a standstill unless we make a bargain. Now I promise to give you back your conch, and never to interfere with your using it, on one condition, which is this. Whatever you get from it, I am to get double. Never, cried the farmer. That would be the old business all over again. Not at all, replied the wily money lender. You will have your share. Now, don't be a dog in the manger, for if you get all you want, what can it matter to you if I am rich or poor? At last, though it went sorely against the grain to be of any benefit to a money lender, the farmer was forced to yield, and from that time, no matter what he gained by the power of the conch, the money lender gained double. And the knowledge that this was so preyed upon the farmer's mind day and night, so that he had no satisfaction out of anything. At last there came a very dry season, so dry that the farmer's crops withered for want of rain. Then he blew his conch and wished for a well to water them, and lo, there was the well, but the money lender had two, two beautiful new wells. This was too much for any farmer to stand, and our friend brooded over it and brooded over it, till at last a bright idea came into his head. He seized the conch, blew it loudly, and cried out, O oh, Ram, I wish to be blind of one eye. And so he was, in a twinkling, but the money lender, of course, was blind of both, and in trying to steer his way between the two new wells, he fell into one and was drowned. Now, this true story shows that a farmer once got the better of a money lender, but only by losing one of his eyes. End of chapter 114. Recording by Evan Smith. Chapter 115 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Chapter 115. How the Sun, the Moon, and the Wind Went Out to Dinner. One day the sun, the moon, and the wind went out to dine with their uncle and aunt, the thunder and lightning. Their mother, one of the most distant stars you see far up in the sky, waited alone for her children's return. Now both the sun and the wind were greedy and selfish. They enjoyed the great feast that had been prepared for them, without a thought of saving any of it to take home to their mother. But the gentle moon did not forget her. Of every dainty dish that was brought round, she placed a small portion under one of her beautiful long fingernails, that the star might also have a share in the treat. On their return, their mother, who had kept watch for them all night long with her little bright eye, said, Well, children, what have you brought home for me? Then the son, who was the eldest, said, I have brought nothing home for you. I went out to enjoy myself with my friends, not to fetch a dinner for my mother." And the wind said, Neither have I brought anything home for you, mother. You could hardly expect me to bring a collection of good things for you when I merely went out for my own pleasure. But the moon said, Mother, fetch a plate, see what I have brought you. And, shaking her hand, she showered down such a choice dinner as never was seen before. Then the star turned to the sun and spoke thus. Because you went out to amuse yourself with your friends, and feasted and enjoyed yourself without any thought of your mother at home, you shall be cursed. Henceforth 
Your rays shall ever be hot and scorching, and shall burn all that they touch. And men shall hate you and cover their heads when you appear. And that is why the sun is so hot to this day. Then she turned to the wind and said, You also, who forgot your mother in the midst of your selfish pleasures, hear your doom. You shall always blow in the hot, dry weather, and shall parch and shrivel all living things, and men shall detest and avoid you from this very time. And that is why the wind in the hot weather is still so disagreeable. But to the moon she said, Daughter, because you remembered your mother and kept for her a share in your own enjoyment, from henceforth you shall be ever cool and calm and bright. No noxious glare shall accompany your pure rays, and man shall always call you blessed. And that is why the moon's light is so soft and cool and beautiful, even to this day. End of chapter 115 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 116 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Sing Raj and the cunning little jackals. Once upon a time, in a great jungle, there lived a great lion. He was Raja of all the country round, and every day he used to leave his den, in the deepest shadow of the rocks, and roar with a loud, angry voice. And when he roared, the other animals in the jungle, who were all his subjects, got very much frightened, and ran here and there, and Sing Raj would pounce upon them and kill them and gobble them up for his dinner. This went on for a long, long time, until, at last, there were no living creatures left in the jungle but two little jackals, Raj Jackal and a Rene Jackal, husband and wife. A very hard time of it the poor little jackals had, running this way and that to escape the terrible Singh Raj. And every day the little Rene Jackal would say to her husband, I am afraid he will catch us today. Do you hear how he is roaring? Oh dear, oh dear. And he would answer her, Never fear, I will take care of you. Let us run on a mile or two. Come, come quick, quick, quick and they would both run away as fast as they could. After some time spent in this way, they found, however, one fine day that the lion was so close upon them that they could not escape. Then the little Rene jackal said, Husband, husband, I feel much frightened. The Singh Raj is so angry he will certainly kill us at once. What can we do? But he answered, Cheer up. We can save ourselves yet. Come, and I'll show you how we may manage it. So what did these cunning little jackals do? But they went to the great lion's den, and when he saw them coming, he began to roar and shake his mane. And he said, You little wretches, come and be eaten at once. I have had no dinner for three whole days, and all that time I have been running over hill and dale, to find you. Roar, roar. Come and be eaten, I say. And he lashed his tail and gnashed his teeth, and looked very terrible indeed. Then the jackal Raja, creeping quite close up to him, said, Oh, great Singh, Raj, we all know you are our master, and we would have come at your bidding long ago. But indeed, sir, there is a much bigger Raj even than you, in this jungle, and he tried to catch hold of us and eat us up, and frightened us so much that we were obliged to run away. What do you mean? growled Singh Raj. There is no king in the jungle but me. Ah, sir, answered the jackal, in truth one would think so, for you are very dreadful. Your very voice is death, 
but it is as we say for we with our own eyes have seen one with whom you could not compete whose equal you can no more be than we are yours whose face is as flaming fire his step as thunder and his power supreme it is impossible interrupted the old lion but show me this raja of whom you speak so much that i may destroy him instantly then the little jackals ran on before him until they reached a great well and pointing down to his own reflection in the water they said see sir there lives the terrible king of whom we spoke when singh raj looked down the well he became very angry for he thought he saw another lion there he roared and shook his great mane and the shadow lion shook his and looked terribly defiant at last beside himself with rage at the violence of his opponent singh raj sprang down to kill him at once but no other lion was there only the treacherous reflection and the sides of the well were so steep that he could not get out again to punish the two jackals who peeped over the top after struggling for some time in the deep water he sank to rise no more and the little jackals threw stones down upon him from above and danced round and round the well singing ayo 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 the king of the forest is dead is dead we have killed the great lion who would have killed us ayo 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 ring a ting ding a ting ring a ting ding a ling ayo 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 end of chapter 116 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter 117 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggum harris sermon there was a certain brahman in a certain village named harrisarman he was poor and foolish and in evil case for want of employment and he had very many children that he might reap the fruit of his misdeeds in a former life he wandered about begging with his family and at last he reached a certain city and entered the service of a rich householder called stultata his sons became keepers of stultata's cows and other property and his wife a servant to him and he himself lived near his house performing the duty of an attendant one day there was a feast on account of the marriage of the daughter of stultata largely attended by many friends of the bridegroom and merrymakers harrisarman hoped that he would be able to fill himself up to the throat with ghee and flesh and other dainties and get the same for his family in the house of his patron while he was anxiously expecting to be fed no one thought of him then he was distressed at getting nothing to eat and he said to his wife at night it is owing to my poverty and stupidity that i am treated with such disrespect here so i will pretend by means of an artifice to possess a knowledge of magic so that i may become an object of respect to this still data so when you get an opportunity tell him that i possess magical knowledge he said this to her and after turning the matter over in his mind while people were asleep he took away from the house of stultata a horse on which his master's son-in-law rode he placed it in concealment at some distance and in the morning his friends of the bridegroom could not find the horse though they searched in every direction then while stultata was distressed at the evil omen 
and searching for thieves who had carried off the horse, the wife of Harasiman came and said to him, My husband is a wise man, skilled in astrology and magical sciences. He can get the horse back for you. Why do you not ask him? When Stilthada heard that, he called Harasiman, who said, Yesterday I was forgotten, but today now the horse is stolen. I am called to mind. And Stilthada then propitiated the Brahmin with these words, I forgot you, forgive me, and asked him to tell him who had taken away their horse. Then Harasiman drew all kinds of pretended diagrams, and said, The horse has been placed by thieves on the boundary line south from this place. It is concealed there, and before it is carried off to a distance, as it will be at close of day, go quickly and bring it. When they heard that, many men ran and brought the horse quickly, praising the discernment of Harasiman. Then Harasiman was honored by all men as a sage, and dwelt there in happiness honored by Stoldata. Now as days went on, much treasure, both of gold and jewels, had been stolen by a thief from the palace of the king. As the thief was not known, the king quickly summoned Harasman on account of his reputation for knowledge of magic, and he, when summoned, tried to gain time and said, I will tell you tomorrow, and then he was placed in a chamber by the king and carefully guarded, and he was sad because he had pretended to have knowledge. Now, in that palace there was a maid named Jehiva, which means tongue, who, with the assistance of her brother, had stolen that treasure from the interior of the palace. She, being alarmed at Harasiman's knowledge, went at night and applied her ear to the door of that chamber in order to find out what he was about, and Harasiman, who was alone inside, was at that very moment blaming his own tongue, that had made a vain assumption of knowledge. He said, O oh, tongue, what is this that you have done through your greediness? Wicked one, you will soon receive punishment in full. When Jehiva heard this, she thought, in her terror, that she had been discovered by this wise man, and she managed to get in where he was, and falling at his feet, she said to the supposed wizard, Brahman, here I am, that Jiva, whom you have discovered to be the thief of the treasure, and after I took it, I buried it in the earth in the garden behind the palace, under a pomegranate tree. So spare me, and receive the small quantity of gold which is in my possession. When Harasiman heard that, he said to her proudly, Depart, I know all this, I know the past, present, and future, but I will not denounce you, being a miserable creature that is implored my protection, but whatever gold is in your possession you must give back to me. When he said this to the maid, she consented, and departed quickly, but Harasiman reflected in his astonishment. Fate brings about, as if in sport, things impossible, for, when calamity was so near, who would have thought chance would have brought us success? While I was blaming my Jehiva, the thief Jehiva suddenly flung herself at my feet. Secret crimes manifest themselves by means of fear. Thus thinking, he passed the night happily in the chamber, and in the morning he brought the king, by some skillful parade of pretended knowledge, into the garden and led him up to the treasure, which was buried under the pomegranate tree, and said that the thief had escaped with part of it. Then the king was pleased and gave him the revenue of many villages. But the minister, named Devanjanin, whispered in the king's ear, How can a man possess such knowledge unattainable by men without having studied the books of magic? You may be certain 
that this is a specimen of the way he makes a dishonest livelihood by having a secret intelligence with thieves it will be much better to test him by some new artifice then the king of his own accord brought a covered picture into which he had thrown a frog and said to harassman brahm if you can guess what there is in this picture i will do you great honor today when the brahm harassman heard that he thought that his last hour had come and he called to mind the pet name of froggy which his father had given him in his childhood in sport and impelled by luck he called to himself by his pet name lamenting his hard fate and suddenly called out this is a fine picture for you froggy it will soon become the swift destroyer of your helpless self the people there when they heard him say that raised a shout of applause because his speech chimed in so well with the object presented to him and murmured ah a great sage he knows even about the frog then the king thinking that this was all due to the knowledge of divination was highly delighted and gave harrisman the revenue of more villages with gold an umbrella and state carriages of all kinds so harrisman prospered in the world end of chapter 117 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter 118 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 118. It is quite true. What a dreadful story! exclaimed a hen. It so frightened me that i did not dare to sleep alone in the hen-house all night i was glad there were so many of us and she began to relate to the other hens who were on the roosting perch above the story she had heard till their feathers stood on end and even the cock let his comb droop it was so dreadful but we will begin at the beginning and discover what really had happened in the hen-house on the other side of the town one evening just before sunset the hens as usual went early to roost and among them was a pretty hen with white feathers and short legs who laid regularly such fine eggs that she was very valuable and much esteemed by all her relations as this hen was flying up in the hen-house to the roosting perch she either pecked or scratched herself with her beak till one of her feathers fell off there goes another she said good-humouredly how beautiful i shall look if one falls off every time i scratch myself this white hen was not only very much esteemed but also the merriest of all the hens in the hen-house but she forgot all about the fallen feather and was soon asleep it became quite dark the hens were seated side by side near each other on the perch but one of them could not sleep for she had partly heard what the white hen said the wakeful hen stayed and thought and then said to her next neighbour have you heard i name no one but a hen has plucked out all her feathers and is not fit to be seen if i were the cock i should despise her the gossiping hen soon after left the hen-house and went to visit an owl who lived just opposite with her husband and children the owl families have very sharp ears and they heard every word that their neighbour the hen said and the little ones rolled their eyes about while the mother owl fanned herself with her wings to repeat what you just have been told is nothing continued the hen but i really and truly heard what was said with my own ears and people must hear a great deal even if they do disapprove it is about a hen who has forgotten what was due to herself in her high position 
she has pulled out all her feathers and then allowed the world to see her in that bare condition prenez garde au enfant said the owl father all this is not fit for the children to hear i will just fly over and tell my neighbor said the mother owl she is a very highly esteemed owl and worthy of our acquaintance who who a who howled the children as the mother flew away and passed by her neighbors the pigeons who were in the pigeon house have you heard have you heard about the hen that has plucked off all her feathers and is going about quite bare she will freeze to death if she is not dead already purr, purr, could the pigeons i heard of it in the neighboring farmyard said another i have as good as seen it with my own eyes the story is really so improper that no one cares to relate it but it is certainly true we believe it we believe every word said the pigeons and they flew down cooing to the farmyard and exclaimed have you heard about the hen the hen why people now say there are two hens who have plucked off all their feathers yet one of them is not like the first who did not wish to be seen for she has positively tried to attract the attention of everybody it was a daring game however they caught cold and are both dead from a fever wake up wake up crowed the cock as he flew out of the hen house to the palings sleep was still in his eyes yet he stood and crowed lustily listen said the hen there is a cock in the next farm who has unluckily lost three of his wives they had plucked off all their feathers and died of cold go away he exclaimed i will not hear it it is an ugly story send it away send it away hissed the bat while the hens cackled and the cock crowed send it away send it away and so the story flew from one farmyard to another until it came back to the last place where the original circumstance occurred there are five hens thus now ran the story who have plucked off all their feathers at least so they say and it made the cock so unhappy that he became quite thin and he has pecked himself so dreadfully ever since from indignation and shame that at last he has fallen down and died covered with blood for these hens had not only disgraced his family but occasioned a great loss to his owner and the hen who had really lost the one feather naturally could not recognize her own story but she was a sensible worthy hen and she said i despise these cackling hens however there shall be no more tittle-tattle of this sort when people have a secret among themselves to gossip about in future i will find it out and send it to the newspapers so that it may travel through the whole land and be heard of by everybody this will just serve these cackling hens and their families right and the newspapers took it up and so altered the wonderful story that at last it was actually true one little feather had become five hens end of chapter one eighteen Chapter 119 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Chapter 119. Manaboso and His Toe. Manaboso, the great wizard of the Indians, was so powerful that he began to think there was nothing he could not do. Very wonderful were many of his feats, and he grew more conceited day by day. Now it chanced that one day he was walking about amusing himself by exercising his extraordinary powers, and at length he came to an encampment where one of the first things he noticed was a child lying in the sunshine, curled up with its toe in its mouth. Manaboso looked at the child for some time and wondered at its extraordinary posture. I have never seen a child before lie like that, he said to himself, but I could lie like it. So saying, he put himself down beside the child, and, taking his right foot in his hand, drew it toward his mouth. 
when he had brought it as near as he could, it was yet a considerable distance away from his lips. I will try with the left foot, said Benaboso. He did so, and found he was no better off. Neither of his feet could he get to his mouth. He curled and twisted and bent his large limbs and gnashed his teeth in rage to find that he could not get his toe in his mouth. All, however, was vain. At length he rose, worn out by his exertions and passions, and walked slowly away in a very ill humor, which was not lessened by the sound of the child's laughter, for Manaboso's efforts had awakened it. Ah, ah, said Manaboso, shall I be mocked by a child? He did not, however, revenge himself upon the victor, but on his way homeward, meeting a boy who did not treat him with a proper respect, he transformed him into a cedar tree. At least, said Manaboso, I can do something. End of chapter 119 Manaboso and his toe Chapter 120 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grofman Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 120 The Most Frugal of Men A man who was considered the most frugal of all the dwellers in a certain kingdom heard of another man who was the most frugal in the whole world. He said to his son thereupon, We indeed live upon little. But if we were more frugal still, we might live upon nothing at all. It will be well worth while for us to get instructions in economy from the most frugal of men. The son agreed, and the two decided that the son should go and inquire whether the master in economic science would take pupils. An exchange of presents being a necessary preliminary to closer intercourse, the father told the son to take the smallest of coins, one farthing, and to buy a sheet of paper of the cheapest sort. The boy, by bargaining, got two sheets of paper for the farthing. The father put away one sheet, cut the other sheet in halves, and on one half drew a picture of a pig's head. This he put into a large covered basket, as if it were the thing which it represented, the usual gift sent in token of great respect. The son took the basket, and after a long journey reached the abode of the most frugal man in the world. The master of the house was absent, but his son received the traveler, learned his errand, and accepted the offering. Having taken from the basket the picture of the pig's head, he said courteously to his visitor, I am sorry that we have nothing in the house that is worthy to take the place of the pig's head in your basket. I will, however, signify our friendly reception of it by putting in four oranges for you to take home with you. Thereupon the young man, without having any oranges at hand, made the motions necessary for putting the fruit into the basket. The son of the most frugal man in the kingdom then took the basket and went to his father to tell of the thrift surpassing his own. When the most frugal man in the world returned home, his son told him that a visitor had been there, having come from a great distance to take lessons in economy. The father inquired what offering he had brought as an introduction, and the son showed the small outline of a pig's head on thin brown paper. The father looked at it, and then asked his son what he had sent as a return present. The son told him that he had merely made the motions necessary for transferring four oranges, and showed how he had clasped the imaginary fruit and deposited it in the visitor's basket. The father immediately flew into a rage and boxed the boy's ears, exclaiming, You extravagant wretch! With your fingers thus far apart you appear to have given him large oranges. Why didn't you measure out small ones? End of chapter 120 The Most Frugal of Men Chapter 121 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. 
Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 121 The Moon Cake A little boy had a cake that a big boy coveted. Designing to get the cake without making the little boy cry so loud as to attract his mother's attention, the big boy remarked that the cake would be prettier if it were more like the moon. The little boy thought that a cake like the moon must be desirable, and on being assured by the big boy that he had made many such, he handed over his cake for manipulation. The big boy took out a mouthful, leaving a crescent with a jagged edge. The little boy was not pleased by the change, and began to whimper, whereupon the big boy pacified him by saying that he would make the cake into a half-moon. So he nibbled off the horns of the crescent, and gnawed the edge smooth. But when the half-moon was made, the little boy perceived that there was hardly any cake left, and he again began to snivel. The big boy again diverted him by telling him that, if he did not like so small a moon, he would have one that was just the size of the real orb. He took the cake, and explained that, just before the new moon is seen, the old moon disappears. Then he swallowed the rest of the cake, and ran off, leaving the little boy waiting for the new moon. End of chapter 121 Chapter 122 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 122 The Ladle That Fell from the Moon. Once there was an old woman who lived on what she got by while from her relatives and neighbors. Her husband's brother lived alone with his only son in a house near hers and when the son brought home a wife, the old woman went to call on the bride. During the call she inquired of the bride whether she had not, since her arrival in the house, heard a scratching at night among the boxes containing her wedding outfit. The bride said she had not. A few days later the old woman came again, and during the visit the bride remarked that, before the matter was mentioned, she had heard no scratching among her boxes, but that since that time she had listened for it and had heard it every night. The old woman advised her to look carefully after her clothing, saying that there were evidently many mice in the house, and that she would likely at any time find her best garments nibbled into shreds. The old woman knew there was no cat in the house, but she inquired whether there was one, and on hearing there was not she offered to lend the young woman her own black and white cat, saying that it would soon extirpate all the mice. The bride accepted the loan, and the old woman brought the cat, and left it in the bride's apartment. After a few hours the cat disappeared, and the bride, supposing it had gone home, made no search for it. It did indeed go home, and the old woman secretly disposed of it, but several days later she came to the young woman and said that, when she lent the cat, her house had been free from mice, but that as soon as the cat was gone, the mice came and multiplied so fast that now everything was overrun by them, and she would be obliged to take the cat home again. The young woman told her that the cat went away the same day that it came, and she had supposed it had gone home. The old woman said it had not, and that nothing could compensate her for the loss of it, for she had reared it herself, and there was never before such a cat for catching mice. That a cat spotted as that one was, was seldom found, and that it was a rare breed, which gave rise to the common saying, A coal-black cat with snowy loins is worth its weight in silver coins, and that the weight of her cat was two hundred ounces. The young woman was greatly surprised by this estimate of the value of the lost cat, and went to her father-in-law and related all that had occurred. The father-in-law, knowing the character of the old woman, could neither eat nor sleep, so harassed was he by the expectation that she would worry his daughter-in-law until the two hundred ounces of silver should be paid. The young woman, being a newcomer, thought very lightly of the matter, until the old woman came again and again and made mention of the cat. When it became apparent that she must defend herself, 
the young woman asked her father-in-law if he had ever lent anything to the old woman and when he said he could not remember having lent anything she begged him to think carefully and see if he could not recall a loan of a tool a dish or a faggot he finally recollected that he had lent her an old wooden ladle but he said it originally cost but a few farthings and was certainly not worth speaking about the next time the old woman came to dun for the amount due for her cat the young woman asked her to return the borrowed ladle the old woman said that the ladle was old and valueless that she had allowed the children to play with it and that they had dropped it in the dirt where it had lain until she picked it up and used it for kindlings the bride responded you expect to enrich yourself and your family by means of your cat i and my family also want money since you cannot give back the ladle we will both go before the magistrate and present our cases if your cat is adjudged to be worth more than my ladle i will pay you the excess but if my ladle is worth more than your cat you must pay me being sure that the cat would by any judge be considered a greater value than the ladle the old woman agreed to the proposition and the two went before the magistrate the young woman courteously gave precedence to the elder and allowed her to make the accusation the old woman set forth her case and claimed two hundred ounces of silver as a compensation for the loss of the cat when she had concluded her statement the judge called on the young woman for her defense she said she could not disprove the statement but that the claim was offset by a ladle that had been borrowed by the plaintiff there was a common saying in the moon overhead at its full you can see the trunk branch and leaf of a cinnamon tree a branch from this tree had one night been blown down before her father-in-law's door and he had had a ladle made from the wood whatever the ladle was put into never diminished by use whether wine oil rice or money the bulk remained the same if no ladle besides this one were used in dipping it a foreign innkeeper hearing of this ladle came and offered her father-in-law three thousand ounces of silver for it but the offer was refused and this ladle was the one the plaintiff had borrowed and destroyed the magistrate on hearing this defense understood that the cat had been a pretext for extortion and decided that the two claims offset each other so that no payment was due from either one end of chapter 122 the ladle that fell from the moon chapter 123 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin the young head of the family there was once a family consisting of a father his three sons and his two daughters-in-law the two daughters-in-law wives of the two elder sons had but recently been brought into the house and were both from one village a few miles away having no mother-in-law living they were obliged to appeal to their father-in-law whenever they wished to visit their former homes and as they were lonesome and homesick they perpetually bothered the old man by asking leave of absence vexed by these constant petitions he set himself to invent a method of putting an end to them and at last gave them leave in this wise you are always begging me to allow you to go and visit your mothers and thinking that i am very hard-hearted because i do not let you go now you may go but only upon condition that when you come back you will each bring me something i want the one shall bring me some fire wrapped in paper and the other wind in a paper unless you promise to bring me these you are never to ask me to let you go home and if you go and fail to get these for me you are never to come back 
the old man did not suppose that these conditions would be accepted but the girls were young and thoughtless and in their anxiety to get away did not consider the impossibility of obtaining the articles required so they made ready with speed and in great glee started off on foot to visit their mothers after they had walked a long distance chatting about what they should do and whom they should see in their native village the high heel of one of them slipped from under her foot and she fell down owing to this mishap both stopped to adjust the misplaced footgear and while doing this the conditions under which they alone could return to their husbands came to mind and they began to cry while they sat there crying by the roadside a young girl came riding along from the fields on a water buffalo she stopped and asked them what was the matter and whether she could help them they told her she could do them no good but she persisted in offering her sympathy and inviting their confidence till they told her their story and then she at once said that if they could go home with her she would show them a way out of their trouble their case seemed so hopeless to themselves and the child was so sure of her own power to help them that they finally accompanied her to her father's house where she showed them how to comply with their father-in-law's demand for the first a paper lantern only would be needed when lighted it would be a fire and its paper surface would compass the blaze so that it would truly be some fire wrapped in paper for the second a paper fan would suffice when flapped the wind would issue from it and the wind wrapped in paper could thus be carried to the old man the two young women thanked the wise child and went on their way rejoicing after a pleasant visit to their old homes they took a lantern and a fan and returned to their father-in-law's house as soon as he saw them he began to vent his anger at their light regard for his commands but they assured him that they had perfectly obeyed him and showed him that what they had brought fulfilled the conditions prescribed much astonished he inquired how it was that they had suddenly become so astute and they told him the story of their journey and of the little girl who had so opportunely come to their relief he inquired whether the little girl was already betrothed and finding she was not engaged a go-between to see if he could get her for a wife for his youngest son having succeeded in securing the girl as a daughter-in-law he brought her home and told all the rest of the family that as there was no mother in the house and as this girl had shown herself to be possessed of extraordinary wisdom she should be the head of the household the wedding festivities being over the sons of the old man ready to return to their usual occupations on the farm but according to their father's order they came to the young bride for instructions she told him they were never to go to or from the fields empty-handed when they went they must carry fertilizers of some sort for the land and when they returned they must bring bundles of sticks for fuel they obeyed and soon had the land in fine condition and so much fuel gathered and none needed to be bought when there were no more sticks roots or weeds to bring she told them to bring stones instead and they soon accumulated an immense pile of stones which were heaped in a yard near their house one day an expert in the discovery of precious stones came along and saw in this pile a block of jade of great value in order to get possession of this stone at a small cost he undertook to buy the whole heap pretending that he wished to use them in building the little head of the family asked an exorbitant price for them and as he could not induce her to take less 
he promised to pay her the sum she asked, and to come two days later to bring the money and to remove the stones. That night the girl thought about the reason for the buyer's being willing to pay so large a sum for the stones, and concluded that the heap must contain a gem. The next morning she sent her father-in-law to invite the buyer to supper, and she instructed the men of her family in regard to his entertainment. The best of wine was to be provided, and the father-in-law was to induce him to talk of precious stones, and to cajole him into telling in what way they were to be distinguished from other stones. The head of the family, listening behind a curtain, heard how the valuable stone in her heap could be discovered. She hastened to find and remove it from the pile, and when her guest had recovered from the effect of the banquet, he saw that the value had departed from his purchase. He went to negotiate again with the seller, and she conducted the conference with such skill that she obtained the price originally agreed upon for the heap of stones, and a large sum besides for the one in her possession. The family, having become wealthy, built an ancestral hall of fine design and elaborate workmanship, and put the words, No Sorrow, as an inscription over the entrance. Soon after, a mandarin passed that way, and noticing this remarkable inscription, had his sedan chair set down, that he might inquire who were the people that professed to have no sorrow. He sent for the head of the family, was much surprised on seeing so young a woman thus appear, and remarked, "'Yours is a singular family. I have never before seen one without sorrow, nor one with so young a head. I will fine you for your impudence. Go and weave me a piece of cloth as long as this road.' "'Very well,' responded the little woman. "'So soon as your excellency shall have found the two ends of the road.' and inform me as to the number of feet in its length. I will at once begin the weaving. Finding himself at fault, the Mandarin added, And I also find you as much oil as there is water in the sea. Certainly, responded the woman, as soon as you shall have measured the sea, and sent me correct information as to the number of gallons, I will at once begin to press out the oil from my beans. Indeed, said the Mandarin, since you are so sharp, perhaps you can penetrate my thoughts. If you can, I will fine you no more. I hold this pet quail in my hand. Now tell me whether I mean to squeeze it to death or to let it fly in the air. Well, said the woman, I am an obscure commoner, and you are a famed magistrate. If you are no more knowing than I, you have no right to find me at all. Now I stand with one foot on one side, my threshold, and the other foot on the other side. Tell me whether I mean to go in or come out. If you cannot guess my riddle, you should not require me to guess yours." Being unable to guess her intention, the Mandarin took her his departure, and the family lived long in opulence and good repute under its chosen head. End of chapter 123 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 124 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 124 A Dreadful Boar a poor old woman who lived with her one little granddaughter in the woods 
was out gathering sticks for fuel, and found a green stalk of sugar cane, which she added to her bundle. She presently met an elf in the form of a wild boar, that asked her for the cane, but she declined giving it to him, saying that, at her age, to stoop and to rise again was to earn what she picked up, and that she was going to take the cane home, and let her little granddaughter suck its sap. The boar, angry at her refusal, said that he would, during the coming night, eat her granddaughter instead of the cane, and went off into the woods. When the old woman reached her cabin, she sat down by the door and wailed, for she knew she had no means of defending herself against the boar. While she sat crying, a vendor of needles came along and asked her what was the matter. She told him, and he said that all he could do was give her a box of needles. This he did, and went on his way. The old woman stuck the needles thickly on the lower half of her door, on its outer side, and then she went on crying. Just then a man came along with a basket of crabs, heard her lamentations, and stopped to inquire what ailed her. She told him, and he said he knew no help for her, but he would do the best he could for her by giving her half his crabs. The old woman put the crabs in her water jar behind the door, and again sat down and cried. A farmer soon came along from the fields, leading his ox and he also asked the cause of her distress, and heard her sad story. He said he was sorry he could not think of any way of preventing the evil she expected, but that he would leave his ox to stay all night with her, as it might be some sort of company for her in her loneliness. She led the ox into her cabin, tied it to the head of the bedstead, gave it some straw, and then cried again. A courier, returning on horseback from a neighboring town, next passed her door, and dismounted to inquire what troubled her. Having heard her tale, he said he would leave his horse to stay with her, and make the ox more contented. So she tied the horse to the foot of her bed, and thinking how surely evil was coming upon her with the night, she burst out crying anew. A boy just then came along with a snapping turtle that he had caught, and stopped to ask what had happened to her. On learning the cause of her weeping, he said it was of no use to contend against sprites, but that he would give her his snapping turtle as a proof of his sympathy. She took the turtle, tied it to the front of her bedstead, and continued to cry. Some men who were carrying millstones then came along, inquired into her trouble, and expressed their compassion by giving her a millstone, which they rolled into her backyard. A little later a man arrived carrying hose and pickaxe, and asked her why she was crying so hard. She told him her grief, and he said he would gladly help her if he could, but he was only a well digger, and could do nothing for her other than to dig her a well. She pointed out a place in the middle of her backyard, and he went to work, and quickly dug a well. On his departure the old woman cried again, until a paper seller came and inquired what was the matter. When she had told him, he gave her a large sheet of white paper, as a token of pity, and she laid it smoothly over the mouth of the well. Nightfall came. The old woman shut and barred her door, put her granddaughter snugly on the wall side of the bed, and then laid down beside her to await the foe. At midnight the boar came, and threw himself against the door to break it in. The needles wounded him sorely so that when he had gained an entrance he was heated and thirsty, and went to the water-jar to drink. When he thrust in his snout the crabs attacked him, clinging to his bristles and pinching his ears, until he rolled over and over to disencumber himself. Then in a rage he approached the front of the bed, but the snapping turtle nipped his tail and made him retreat under the feet of the horse, who kicked him over to the ox, who tossed him back to the horse, and thus beset, he was glad to escape to the back yard, to take a rest, and to consider the situation. Seeing a clean paper spread on the ground, he went to lie upon it, and fell into the well. The old woman heard the fall, rushed out, rolled the millstone down on him, and crushed him. End of chapter 124 A Dreadful Boar
Chapter 125 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 125 The Old Man and the Devils. A long time ago there was an old man who had a big lump on the right side of his face. One day he went into the mountain to cut wood, when the rain began to pour, and the wind to blow so very hard that, finding it impossible to return home, and filled with fear, he took refuge in the hollow of an old tree. While sitting there, doubled up and unable to sleep, he heard the confusing sound of many voices in the distance gradually approaching to where he was. He said to himself, How strange! I thought I was all alone on the mountain, but I hear the voices of many people. So, taking courage, he peeped out, and saw a great crowd of strange-looking beings. Some were red and dressed in green clothes, others were black and dressed in red clothes. Some had only one eye, and others had no mouth, indeed, it was quite impossible to describe their varied and strange looks. They kindled a fire, so that it became as light as day. They sat down in two crossed rows, and began to drink wine, and make merry, just like human beings. They passed the wine cup around so often, that many of them soon drank too much. One of the young devils got up, and began to sing a merry song, and to dance. So also the others some dancing well, others badly. One said, We have had uncommon fun tonight, but I would like to see something new. Then the old man, losing all fear, thought he would like to dance, and saying, Let come what will, if I die for it, I will have a dance too, crept out of the hollow tree, and, with his cap slipped over his nose, and his axe sticking in his belt, began to dance. The devils, in great surprise, jumped up, saying, Who is this? But the old man advanced and receded, swaying to and fro, and posturing this way and that. The whole crowd laughed and enjoyed the fun, saying, How well the old man dances! You must always come to join us in our sport. But, for fear you might not come, you will give us a pledge that you will. So the devils consulted together, and agreeing that the lump on his face, which was a token of wealth, was what he valued most highly, demanded that it should be taken. The old man replied, I have had this lump for many years, and would not without good reason part with it. But you may have it, or an eye, or my nose either, if you wish. So the devils laid hold of it, twisting and pulling, and took it off without giving him any pain and put it away as a pledge that he would come back. Just then the day began to dawn, and the birds to sing, so the devils hurried away. The old man felt his face, and found it quite smooth, and not a trace of a lump left. He forgot all about cutting wood, and hastened home. His wife, seeing him, exclaimed in great surprise, What has happened to you? So he told her all that had befallen him. Now among the neighbors there was another old man who had a big lump on the left side of his face. Hearing all about how the first old man had got rid of his misfortune, he determined that he would also try the same plan. So he went and crept into the hollow tree, and waited for the devils to come. Sure enough, they came just as he was told, and they sat down, drank wine, and made merry just as they did before. The second old man, afraid and trembling, crept out of the hollow tree. The devils welcomed him, saying, The old man has come! Now let us see him dance! This old fellow was awkward, and did not dance as well as the other. So the devils cried out, You dance badly, and are getting worse and worse. We will give you back the lump which we took from you as a pledge. Upon this one of the devils brought the lump, and stuck it on the side of his face. So the poor old fellow returned home with a lump on each side. End of chapter 125. 
The Old Man and the Devils. Chapter 126 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T.J. Burns. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 126 The Wonderful Tea Kettle. A long, long time ago, at the temple of Morinji, in the province of Kotsuke, there lived an old priest. This old priest was very fond of the ceremonial preparing and drinking of tea, known as Chanoyu. Indeed, it was his chief interest and pleasure in life to conduct this ceremony. One day, he chanced to find in a second-hand shop a very nice-looking old tea kettle, which he bought and took home with him, highly pleased by its fine shape and artistic appearance. Next day, he brought out his new purchase and sat for a long time, turning it round on this side and on that and admiring it. You are a regular beauty, that's what you are, he said. I shall invite all my friends to the Chanoyu, and how astonished they will be at finding such an exquisite kettle as this. He placed his treasure on the top of a box where he could see it to the best advantage, and sat, admiring it and planning how he should invite his guests. After a while, he became drowsy and began to nod, and at last, fell forward, his head on his desk, fast asleep. Then a wonderful transformation took place. The tea kettle began to move. From its spout appeared a hairy head. At the other side, out came a fine bushy tail. Next, four feet made themselves visible while fine fur seemed gradually to cover the surface of the kettle. At last, jumping off the box, it began capering around the room for all the world, just like a badger. Three young novices, pupils of the priest, who were at study in the next room, heard the noise, and when one of them peeped through the sliding doors, what was his astonishment to see the tea kettle? on four feet, dancing up and down the room. He cried out, Oh, what a wonderful thing! The tea kettle is changed into a badger. What? said the second novice. Do you mean to say that the tea kettle is turned into a badger? What nonsense! So saying, he pushed his companion to one side and peeped in. But he also was terrified by what he saw and screamed. It's a goblin. It's coming at us. Let us run away. The third novice was not so easily frightened. Come, this is rather fun, said he. How the creature does jump, to be sure. I will rouse the master and let him see, too. So he went into the room and shook the priest, crying, Wake, master, wake! A strange thing has happened. What's the matter? said the old man, drowsily rubbing his eyes. What a noisy fellow you are! Anyone would be noisy when such a strange thing as this is going on, said the novice. Only look, master, your tea kettle has got feet and is running about. What? 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 What's that you say? asked the priest again. The kettle. Got feet? What's this? Let me see. But by the time the old man was thoroughly roused, the tea kettle had turned into its ordinary shape and stood quietly on its box again. What foolish young fellows you are, 
said the priest. There stands a kettle on top of a box. Surely there is nothing very strange in that. No, no. I have heard of the rolling pin that grew a pair of wings and flew away. But long as I have lived, never have I heard before of a tea kettle walking about on its own feet. You will never make me believe that. But for all that, the priest was a little uneasy in his mind and kept thinking of the incident all that day. When evening came, and he was alone in his room, he took down the kettle, filled it with water, and set it upon the embers to boil, intending to make some tea. But as soon as the water began to boil, Hot! Hot! cried the kettle, and jumped off the fire. Help! Help! cried the priest, terrified out of his wits. But when the novices rushed to his help, the kettle at once resumed its natural form. So one of them, seizing a stick, cried, We'll soon find out whether it's alive or not, and began beating it with might and main. There was evidently no life in the thing, and only a metallic, Clang! 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 responded to his lusty blows. Then the old priest heartily repented having bought the mischievous tea kettle and was debating in his own mind how he should get rid of it when who should drop in but the tinker. Here's the very man, thought the priest. A bargain was soon struck. The tinker bought the tea kettle for a few coppers and carried it home, well pleased with his purchase. Before going to bed, he took another look at it and found it still better than he had at first thought. So he went to sleep that night in the best of spirits. In the midst of a pleasant dream, the tinker suddenly started up, thinking he heard somebody moving in the room. But when he opened his eyes and looked about, he could see nobody. It was only a dream, I suppose, said he to himself, as he turned over and went to sleep again but he was disturbed once more by someone calling, Tinker! Tinker! Get up! Get up! This time he sprang up, wide awake, and lo and behold, there was the tea kettle with a head, tail, feet, and fur of a badger strutting up and down the room. Goblin! Goblin, shrieked the tinker, but the tea kettle laughed and said, Don't be frightened, my dear tinker. I am not a goblin, only a wonderful tea kettle. My name is Bumbuko Chagama, and I will bring good luck to anyone who treats me well. But, of course, I don't like to be set on the fire and then beaten with sticks, as happened to me at the temple yesterday. How can I please you, then? asked the tinker. Shall I keep you in a box? Oh, no, no, answered the tea kettle. I like nice sweet things to eat, and sometimes a little wine to drink, just like yourself. Will you keep me in your house and feed me? And as I would not be a burden upon you, I will work for you in any way you like. To this the tinker agreed. Next morning he provided a good feast for Bumbuku, who then spoke. I certainly am a wonderful and accomplished tea kettle, and my advice is that you take me round the country as a show with accompaniments of singing and music. The tinker, thinking well of this advice, at once started a show, which he named the Bambuku Chagama. The lucky tea kettle at once made the affair a success, for not only did he walk about on four legs, but he danced the tightrope and went through all kinds of acrobatic performances, 
ending by making a profound bow to the spectators and begging for their future patronage. The fame of these performances soon spread abroad, and the theater was filled daily to overflowing, until at length even the princes of the land sent to order the tinker and his kettle to come to them, and the show would take place to the great delight of the princesses and ladies of the court. At last the tinker grew so rich that he retired from business, and wishing his faithful kettle also to be at rest, he took it back, together with a large share of his wealth, to the temple of Moringi, where it was laid up as a precious treasure, and some say even worshipped as a saint. End of chapter 126 Recording by T.J. Burns Chapter 127 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. The Wonderful Mallet. Once upon a time there were two brothers. The elder was an honest and good man, but he was very poor, while the younger, who was dishonest and stingy, had managed to pile up a large fortune. The name of the elder was Cain, and that of the younger was Cho. Now one day Cain went to Cho's house and begged for the loan of some seed rice and some silkworm eggs for last season had been unfortunate, and he was in want of both. Cho had plenty of good rice and excellent silkworm eggs, but he was such a miser that he did not want to lend them. At the same time, he felt ashamed to refuse his brother's request, so he gave him some worm-eaten musty rice and some dead eggs, which he felt sure would never hatch. Cain, never suspecting that his brother would play him such a shabby trick, put plenty of mulberry leaves with the eggs, to be food for the silkworms when they should appear. Appear they did, and throve and grew wonderfully, much better than those of the stingy brother, who was angry and jealous when he heard of it. Going to Cain's house one day, and finding his brother was out, Cho took a knife and killed all the silkworms, cutting each poor little creature in two. Then he went home without having been seen by anybody. When Cain came home, he was dismayed to find his silkworms in this state. But he did not suspect who had done him this bad trick, and tried to feed them with mulberry leaves as before. The silkworms came to life again, and doubled the number, for now each half was a living worm. They grew and throve, and the silk they spun was twice as much as Cain had expected. So now he began to prosper. The envious Cho, seeing all this, cut all his own silkworms in half. But alas, they did not come to life again. So he lost a great deal of money, and became more jealous than ever. Cain also planted the rice seed which he had borrowed from his brother, and it sprang up and grew and flourished far better than Cho's had done. The rice ripened well, and he was just intending to cut and harvest it, when a flight of a thousand upon thousands of swallows came and began to devour it. Cain was much astonished, and shouted and made as much noise as he could, in order to drive them away. They flew away, indeed, but came back immediately, so that he kept driving them away, and they kept flying back again. At last he pursued them into a distant field, where he lost sight of them. He was by this time so hot and tired that he sat down to rest. By little and little his eyes closed, his head dropped away upon a mossy bank, and he fell fast asleep. Then he dreamed that a merry band of children came into the field, laughing and shouting, they sat down upon the ground in a ring, and one who seemed the eldest, a boy of fourteen or fifteen, 
came close to the bank on which he lay asleep, and raising a big stone near his head, drew from under it a small wooden mallet. Then in his dream Cain saw this big boy stand in the middle of the ring with the mallet in his hand, and asked the children each in turn, What would you like the mallet to bring you? The first child answered, A kite. The big boy shook the mallet, upon which appeared immediately a fine kite with tail and string, all complete. The next cried, A battle door. Out sprang a splendid battle door and a shower of shuttlecocks. Then a little girl shyly whispered, A doll. The mallet was shaken, and there stood a beautifully dressed doll. I should like all the fairy tale books that have ever been written in the whole world said a bright-eyed intelligent maiden and no sooner had she spoken than piles upon piles of beautiful books appeared and so at last the wishes of all the children were granted and they stayed a long time in the field with the things that the mallet had given them at last they got tired and prepared to go home the big boy first carefully hiding the mallet under the stone from whence he had taken it then all the children went away. Presently Cain awoke, and gradually remembered his dream. In preparing to rise he turned around, and there, close to where his head had lain, was the big stone he had seen in his dream. How strange, he thought, expecting he hardly knew what. He raised the stone, and there lay the mallet. He took it home with him, and following the example of the children he had seen in his dream, shook it at the same time calling out gold, or rice, silk, or sake, whatever he called for immediately flew out of the mallet, so that he could have everything he wanted, and as much of it as he liked. Cain, being now a rich and prosperous man, Cho was of course jealous of him, and determined to find a magic mallet which would do as much for him he came therefore to Cain and borrowed seed rice, which he planted and tended with care, being impatient for it to grow and ripen soon. It grew well and ripened soon, and now Cho watched daily for the swallows to appear, and to be sure one day a flight of swallows came and began to eat up the rice. Cho was delighted at this, and drove them away, pursuing them to the distant field, where Cain had followed them before. There he lay down, intending to go to sleep as his brother had done, but the more he tried to go to sleep, the wider awake he seemed. Presently the band of children came skipping and jumping, so he shut his eyes and pretended to be asleep, but all the time watched anxiously what the children would do. They sat down in a ring, as before, and the big boy came close to Cho's head and lifted the stone. He put down his hand to lift the mallet, but no mallet was there. One of the children said, Perhaps that lazy old farmer has taken our mallet. So the big boy laid hold of Cho's nose, which was rather long, and gave it a good pinch. And all the other children ran up and pinched and pulled his nose. And the nose itself got longer and longer. First it hung down to his chin, then over his chest next down to his knees, and at last to his very feet. It was in vain that Cho protested his innocence. The children pinched and pummeled him to their heart's content, then capered round him, shouting and laughing, and making game of him, and so at last went away. Now Cho was left alone, a sad and angry man, holding his long nose painfully in both hands, he slowly took his way toward his brother Cain's house. Here he related all that had happened to him from the very day when he had behaved so badly about the seed rice and silkworm eggs. He humbly begged his brother to pardon him, and if possible do something to restore his unfortunate nose to his proper size. The kind-hearted Cain pitied him, and said, you have been dishonest and mean, and selfish and envious, and that is why you have got this punishment. If you promise to behave better for the future, I will try what can be done. 
So saying, he took the mallet and rubbed Cho's nose with it gently, and the nose gradually became shorter and shorter, until at last it came back to its proper shape and size. But ever after, if at any time Cho felt inclined to be selfish and dishonest, as he did now and then, his nose began to smart and burn, and he fancied he felt it beginning to grow. So great was his terror of having a long nose again that these symptoms never failed to bring him back to his good behavior. End of chapter 127 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 128 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 128. The Tongue Cut Sparrow. Once upon a time, a cross old woman laid some starch in a basin, intending to put it in the clothes in her wash tub. But a sparrow that a woman, her neighbor, kept as a pet, ate it up. Seeing this, the cross old woman seized the sparrow, and, saying, You hateful thing, cut its tongue and let it go. When the neighbor woman heard that her pet sparrow had got its tongue cut for this offense, she was greatly grieved, and set out with her husband over mountains and plains to find where it had gone, crying, Where does the tongue-cut sparrow stay? Where does the tongue-cut sparrow stay? At last they found its home. When the sparrow saw that its old master and mistress had come to see it, it rejoiced, and brought them into its house, and thanked them for their kindness in old times. It spread a table for them, and loaded it with sake and fish, till there was no more room, and made its wife and children and grandchildren all serve the table. At last, throwing away its drinking cup, it danced a jig called the Sparrow's Dance, and thus they spent the day. When it began to grow dark, and there was talk of going home, the Sparrow brought out two wicker baskets, and said, Will you take the heavy one, or shall I give you the light one? The old people replied, We are old, so give us the light one. It will be easier to carry it. The Sparrow then gave them the light basket, and they returned with it to their home. Let us open it and see what is in it, they said. And when they opened it and looked, they found gold and silver and jewels and rolls of silk. They never expected anything like this. The more they took out, the more they found inside. The supply was inexhaustible, so that the house at once became rich and prosperous. When the cross old woman who had cut the sparrow's tongue saw this, she was filled with envy and went and asked her neighbor where the sparrow lived, and all about the way. I will go too, she said, and at once set out on her search. Again the sparrow brought out two wicker baskets, and asked as before, Will you take the heavy one, or shall I give you the light one? Thinking the treasure would be great in proportion to the weight of the basket, the old woman replied, Let me have the heavy one. Receiving this, she started home with it on her back, the sparrows laughing at her as she went. It was as heavy as a stone, and hard to carry, but at last she got back with it to her house. Then, when she took off the lid and looked in, a whole troop of frightful creatures came bouncing out from the inside, and at once they caught her up and flew away with her. End of Chapter 128 The Tongue-Cut Sparrow Chapter 129 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 129 Battle of the Monkey and the Crab. A monkey and a crab once met when going round a mountain. The monkey had picked up a persimmon seed, 
and the crab had a piece of toasted rice cake. The monkey, seeing this, and wishing to get something that could be turned to a good account at once, said, Pray exchange that rice cake for this persimmon seed. The crab, without a word, gave up his cake, and took the persimmon seed, and planted it. At once it sprang up, and soon became a tree so high that one had to look far up to see it. The tree was full of persimmons, but the crab had no means of climbing it, so he asked the monkey to scramble up and get the fruit for him. The monkey got up on a limb of the tree and began to eat the persimmons. The unripe ones he threw at the crab, but all the ripe and good ones he put in his pouch. The crab under the tree thus got his shell badly brewed, and only by good luck escaped into his hole, where he lay distressed with pain and not able to get up. Now when the relatives of the household of the crab heard how matters stood, they were surprised and angry, and declared war, and attacked the monkey, who, leading forth a numerous following, bade defiance to the other party. The crabs, finding themselves unable to meet and cope with this force, became still more exasperated and enraged, and retreated into their hole, and held a council of war. Then came a rice mortar, a pestle, a bee, and an egg, and together they devised a deep-laid plot to be avenged. First they requested that peace be made with the crabs, and thus they induced the king of the monkeys to enter their hole unattended, and seated him on the hearth. The monkey, not suspecting any plot, took the habashi, or poker, to stir up the slumbering fire, when, bang, went the egg that was lying hidden in the ashes, and burned the monkey's arm. Surprised and alarmed, he plunged his arm into the pickling tub in the kitchen to relieve the pain of the burn. Then the bee, which was hidden near the tub, stung him sharply in the face, already wet with tears. Without waiting to brush off the bee and howling bitterly, he rushed for the back door, but just then some seaweed entangled his legs and made him slip. Then down came the pestle, tumbling on him from the shelf, and the mortar, too, came rolling down on him from the roof of the porch and broke his back, and so weakened him that he was unable to rise up. Then out came the crabs in a crowd, and brandishing on high their pinchers, they pinched the monkey so sorely that he begged them for forgiveness, and promised never to repeat his meanness and treachery. End of chapter 129 The Battle of the Monkey and the Crab Chapter 130 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Cubs Triumph. Once upon a time there lived in a forest a badger and a mother fox with one little cub. There were no other beasts in the wood, because the hunters had killed them all with bows and arrows, or by setting snares. The deer and the wild boar, the hares, the weasels, and the stouts, even the bright little squirrels, had been shot, or had fallen into traps. At last only the badger and the fox, with her young one, were left and they were starving, for they dared not venture from their holes for fear of the traps. They did not know what to do or where to turn for food. At last the badger said, I have thought of a plan. I will pretend to be dead. You must change yourself into a man, and take me into the town and sell me. With the money you get from me, you must buy food and bring it into the forest." When I get a chance, I will run away and come back to you, and we will eat our dinner together. Mind you wait for me, and don't eat any of it until I come. Next week it will be your turn to be dead, and my turn to sell, do you see? The fox thought this plan would do very well, so as soon as the badger had laid down and pretended to be dead, she said to her little cub, be sure not to come out of the hole until I come back. Be very good and quiet, 
and I will soon bring you some nice dinner. She then changed herself into a woodcutter, took the badger by the heels and swung him over her shoulders, and trudged off into the town. There she sold the badger for a fair price, and with the money bought some fish, some tofu. Footnote. Curd made from white beans. End footnote. And some vegetables. She then ran back to the forest as fast as she could, changed herself into a fox again, and crept into her hole to see if little cub was all right. Little cub was there, safe enough, but very hungry, and wanted to begin upon the tofu at once. No, no, said the mother fox, fairs play a jewel. We must wait for the badger. Soon the badger arrived, quite out of breath with running so fast. I hope you haven't been eating any of the dinner, he panted. I could not get away sooner. The man you sold me to brought his wife to look at me, and boasted how cheap he had bought me. You should have asked twice as much. At last they left me alone, and then I jumped up and ran away as fast as I could. The badger, the fox, and the cub now sat down to dinner, and had a fine feast, the badger taking care to get the best bits for himself. Some days after, when all the food was finished, they had begun to get hungry again. The badger said to the fox, Now it's your turn to die. So the fox pretended to be dead, and the badger changed himself into a hunter, shouldered the fox, and went off to the town, where he made a good bargain, and sold her for a nice little sum of money. You have already seen that the badger was greedy and selfish. What do you think he did now? He wished to have all the money and all the food it would buy for himself, so he whispered to the man who had bought the fox. That fox is only pretending to be dead. Take care he doesn't run away. We'll soon settle that, said the man, as he knocked the fox on the head with a big stick and killed her. The badger next laid out the money in buying all the nice things he could think of. He carried them off to the forest, and there ate them all up himself, without giving one bit to the poor little cub, who was all alone crying for its mother, very sad and very hungry. Poor little motherless cub! But being a clever little fox, he soon began to put two and two together and at least felt quite sure that the badger had, in some way, caused the loss of his mother. He made up his mind that he would punish the badger, and as he was not big enough or strong enough to do it by force, he was obliged to try another plan. He did not let the badger see how angry he was with him, but said in a friendly way, let us have a game of changing ourselves into men. If you can change yourself so cleverly that I cannot find you out, you will have won the game. But if I change myself so that you cannot find me out, then I shall have won the game. I will begin, if you like, and you may be sure. I shall turn myself into somebody very grand while I am about it. The badger agreed, so then, instead of changing himself at all, the cunning little cub just went and hid himself behind a tree, and watched to see what would happen. Presently there came along the bridge leading into the town a nobleman, seated in a sedan chair, a great crowd of servants and men at arms following him. The badger was quite sure that this must be the fox. So he ran up to the sedan chair, put in his head, and cried, I found you out. I've won the game. A badger, a badger, off with his head, cried the nobleman. So one of the retainers cut off the badger's head with one blow of his sharp sword, the little cub all the time laughing unseen behind the tree. End of chapter 130 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver.
BC. Chapter 131 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 131 The Silly Jellyfish. Once upon a time, the king of dragons, who had till then lived as a bachelor, took it into his head to get married. His bride was a young dragonette just sixteen years old, lovely enough, in very sooth, to become the wife of a king. Great were the rejoicings on the occasion. The fishes, both great and small, came to pay their respects, and to offer gifts to the newly wedded pair, and for some days all was feasting and merriment. But alas, even dragons have their trials. Before a month had passed, the young dragon queen fell ill. The doctors dosed her with every medicine that was known to them, but all to no purpose. At last they shook their heads and declared that there was nothing more to be done. The illness must take its course, and she would probably die. But the sick queen said to her husband, I know something that will cure me. Only fetch me a live monkey's liver to eat, and I shall get well at once. A live monkey's liver, exclaimed the king. What are you thinking of, my dear? Why, you forget that we dragons live in the sea, while monkeys live far away from here, among the forest trees on land. A monkey's liver? Why, darling, you must be mad. Hereupon the young dragon queen burst into tears. I only ask you for one small thing, whimpered she, and you won't get it for me. I always thought you didn't really love me. Oh, I wish I had stayed at home with my ma mama and my papa. Here her voice choked with sobs, and she could say no more. Well, of course the dragon king did not like to have it thought that he was unkind to his beautiful young wife. So he sent for his trusty servant, the jellyfish, and said, it is a rather difficult job, but what I want you to try to do is to swim across to the land and persuade a live monkey to come here with you. In order to make the monkey willing to come, you can tell him how much nicer everything is here in Dragonland than away where he lives. But what I really want him for is to cut out his liver and use it as medicine for your young mistress, who, as you know, is dangerously ill. So the jellyfish went off on his strange errand. In those days he was just like any other fish, with eyes and fins and a tail. He even had little feet, which made him able to walk on the land as well as to swim in the water. It did not take him many hours to swim across to the country where the monkeys lived, and, fortunately, there just happened to be a fine monkey skipping about among the branches of the trees near the place where he landed. So the jellyfish said, Mr. Monkey, I have come to tell you of the country far more beautiful than this. It lies beyond the waves, and it is called Dragonland. There is pleasant weather there all year round. There is always plenty of ripe fruit on the trees, and there are none of those mischievous creatures you call men. If you will come with me, I will take you there. Just get on my back. The monkey thought it would be fun to see a new country, so he leapt on the jellyfish's back, and off they started across the water. But when they had gone about halfway, he began to fear that perhaps there might be some hidden danger, for it seemed so odd to be fetched suddenly in that way by a stranger. So he said to the jellyfish, What made you think of coming to me? The jellyfish answered, My master, the king of dragons, wants you in order to cut out your liver and make it as medicine for his wife, the queen, who is sick. Oh, that's your little game, is it? thought the monkey. But he kept his thoughts to himself, and only said, Nothing would please me better than to be of service to their majesties. But it so happens that I left my liver hanging to a branch of a big chestnut tree where you found me skipping about. A liver is a thing that weighs a good deal, so I generally take it out and play about without it during the daytime, we must go back for it. 
the jellyfish agreed that there was nothing else that could be done under the circumstances for silly creature that he was he did not see that the monkey was telling a story in order to avoid getting killed and having his liver used as medicine for the fanciful young dragon queen when they reached the shore of the monkey land again the monkey bounded off the jellyfish's back and up to the topmost branch of the chestnut tree in less than no time then he said i do not see my liver here perhaps someone has taken it away but i will look for it you meantime had better go back and tell your master what has happened he might be anxious about you if you do not come home before dark so the jellyfish started off a second time and when he got home he told the dragon king everything just as it had happened but the king flew into a passion with him for his stupidity and halloed to his officers saying away with this fellow take him and beat him to a jelly don't let a single bone remain unbroken in his body so the officer seized him and beat him as the king had commanded that is the reason why to this very day jellyfishes have no bones but are just nothing more than a mass of pulp as for the dragon queen when she found she could not have the monkey's liver why she made up her mind that the only thing to do was to get well without it end of chapter 131 the silly jellyfish chapter 132 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc tales of laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Chin, chin, Kobe Kama. Once there was a little girl who was very pretty, but also very lazy. Her parents were rich and had a great many servants, and these servants were very fond of the little girl and did everything for her which she ought to have been able to do for herself. Perhaps this was what made her so lazy. When she grew up into a beautiful woman, she still remained lazy. But as the servants always dressed and undressed her and arranged her hair, she looked very charming and nobody thought about her faults. At last she was married to a brave warrior and went away with him to live in another house where there were but few servants. She was sorry not to have as many servants as she had had at home because she was obliged to do several things for herself which other folks had always done for her and it was a great deal of trouble to her to dress herself and to take care of her own clothes and keep herself looking neat and pretty to please her husband but as he was a warrior and often had to be far away from home with the army she could sometimes be just as lazy as she wished and her husband's parents were very old and good nature and never scolded her well one night while her husband was away with the army she was awakened by a queer little noises in her room by the light of a big paper lantern she could see very well and she saw strange things hundreds of little men dressed just like japanese warriors but only about one inch high were dancing all around her pillow they wore the same kind of dress her husband wore on holidays kamishimo a long robe with square shoulders and their hair was tied up in knots and each wore two tiny swords they all looked at her as they danced and laughed and they all sang the same song over and over again chin chin kobakama yomo fuke soro o jimere himigimi ya ton ton which meant we are the chin chin kobakama the hour is late sleep honorable noble darling the words seemed very polite but she soon saw that the little men were only making cruel fun of her they also made ugly faces at her she tried to catch some of them 
but they jumped about so quickly that she could not. Then she tried to drive them away, but they would not go, and they never stopped singing, Chin, Chin, Kobikama, and laughing at her. Then she knew they were little fairies, and became so frightened that she could not even cry out. They danced around her until morning. Then they all vanished suddenly. She was ashamed to tell anybody what had happened, because, as she was the wife of a warrior, she did not wish anybody to know how frightened she had been. Next night, again, the little man came and danced, and they came also the night after that, and every night, always at the same hour, which the old Japanese used to call the hour of the ox, that is, about two o'clock in the morning by our time. At last she became very sick, through want of sleep and through fright. But the little man would not leave her alone. When her husband came back home, he was very sorry to find her sick in bed. At first she was afraid to tell him what made her ill, for fear that he would laugh at her. But he was so kind and coaxed her so gently that after a while she told him what happened every night. He did not laugh at her at all, but looked very serious for a time. Then he asked, At what time do they come? She answered, Always at the same hour, the hour of the ox. Very well, said her husband. Tonight I shall hide and watch for them. Do not be frightened. So that night the warrior hid himself in the closet in the sleeping room, and kept watch through a chink between the sliding doors. He waited and watched until the hour of the ox. Then, all at once, the little men came up through the mats, and began their dance and their song, Chin, Chin, Kobe Kama, Yomo Fuke Soro. They looked so queer, and danced in such a funny way, that the warrior could scarcely keep from laughing. But he saw his young wife's frightened face, and then, remembering that nearly all Japanese ghosts and goblins are afraid of a sword, he drew his blade and rushed out of the closet and struck at the little dancers. Immediately they all turned into, what do you think? Toothpicks. There were no more little warriors, only a lot of old toothpicks scattered over the mats. The young wife had been too lazy to put her toothpicks away properly, and every day, after having used a new toothpick, she would stick it down between the mats on the floor to get rid of it, so the little fairies who take care of the floor mats became angry with her and tormented her. Her husband scolded her, and she was so ashamed that she did not know what to do. A servant was called, and the toothpicks were taken away and burned, and after that the little men never came back again. End of chapter 132 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 133 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 133 The Old Woman Who Lost Her Dumplings. Long, long ago there was a funny old woman who liked to laugh and make dumplings of rice flour. One day, while she was preparing some dumplings for dinner, she let one fall, and it rolled into a hole in the earthen floor of her little kitchen, and disappeared. The old woman tried to reach it by putting her hand down the hole, and all at once the earth gave way, and the old woman fell in. She fell quite a distance, but was not a bit hurt, and when she got up on her feet again, she saw that she was standing on a road just like the road before her house. It was quite light down there, and she could see plenty of rice fields, but no one in them. How all this happened I cannot tell you, but it seems that the old woman had fallen into another country. The road she had fallen upon sloped very much, so after having looked for her dumpling in vain, she thought that it must have rolled further away down the hill. 
she ran down the road to look crying my dumpling my dumpling where is that dumpling of mine after a little while she saw a stone image standing by the roadside and she said calling it by its name oh jizo son did you see my dumpling jizo answered yes i saw your dumpling rolling by me down the road but you had better not go any further because there is a wicked oni living down there who eats people but the old woman only laughed and ran on further down the road crying my dumpling my dumpling where is that dumpling of mine and she came to another statue of jizo and asked it o oh, kind jizo did you see my dumpling and jizo said yes i saw your dumpling go by a little while ago but you must not run any further because there is a wicked oni down there who eats people but she only laughed and ran on still crying out my dumpling my dumpling where is that dumpling of mine and she came to a third jizo and asked it oh dear jizo did you see my dumpling but jizo said don't talk about your dumpling now there is an oni coming squat down here behind my sleeve and don't make any noise presently the oni came very close and stopped and bowed to jizo and said good day jizo san jizo said good day too very politely then the oni suddenly sniffed the air two or three times in a suspicious way and cried out jizo san jizo san I smell the smell of mankind somewhere, don't you? Oh, said Jizo, perhaps you are mistaken. No, no, said the Oni after sniffing the air again. I smell the smell of mankind. Then the old woman could not help laughing. Tee hee hee! And the Oni immediately reached down his big hairy hand behind Jizo's sleeve and pulled her out, still laughing. Hee hee hee! ah ha cried the oni then jizo said what are you going to do with that good old woman you must not hurt her i won't said the oni but i will take her home with me to cook for us tee hee hee laughed the old woman very well said jizo but you must really be kind to her if you are not i shall be very angry i won't hurt her at all promised the oni and she will only have to do a little work for us every day. Goodbye, jizo san Then the Oni took the old woman far down the road, till they came to a wide river, where there was a boat. He put her into the boat, and took her across the river to his house. It was a very large house. He led her at once into the kitchen, and told her to cook something for dinner for himself and the other Oni who lived with him and he gave her a small wooden rice paddle and said you must always put only one grain of rice into the pot and when you stir that one grain of rice in the water with this paddle the grain will multiply until the pot is full so the old woman put just one grain of rice into the pot as the oni told her and began to stir it with the paddle and as she stirred the one grain became two then four, then eight, then sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, and so on. Every time she moved the paddle, the rice increased in quantity, and in a few minutes the great pot was full. After that, the funny old woman stayed a long time in the house of the Oni, and every day cooked food for him and for all his friends. The Oni never hurt or frightened her, and her work was made quite easy, with the magic paddle although she had to cook a very very great quantity of rice because an oni eats much more than any human being eats but she felt lonely and always wished very much to go back to her little house and make her dumplings and one day when the oni were all out somewhere she thought she would try to run away she first took the magic paddle and slipped it into her girdle and then she went down to the river no one saw her, and the boat was there. She got into it and pushed off, and, as she could row very well, she was soon far away from the shore. But the river was very wide, 
and she had not rowed more than one-fourth of the way across, when the Oni, all of them, came back to the house. They found that their cook was gone, and the magic paddle, too. They ran down to the river at once, and saw the old woman rowing away very fast. Perhaps they could not swim. At all events, they had no boat, and they thought the only way they could catch the funny old woman would be to drink up all the water in the river before she got to the other bank. So they knelt down, and began to drink so fast that, before the old woman had got halfway over, the water had become quite low. But the old woman kept on rowing, until the water had got so shallow that the Oni stopped drinking, and began to wade across. Then she dropped her oar, took the magic paddle from her girdle, and shook it at the Oni, and made such funny faces that the Oni all burst out laughing. But the moment they laughed, all the water came up that they had drunk, and so the river became full again. The Oni could not cross, and the funny old woman got safely over to the other side, and ran away up the road as fast as she could. She never stopped running until she found herself at home again. After that she was very happy, for she could make dumplings whenever she pleased. Besides, she had the magic paddle to make rice for her. She sold her dumplings to her neighbors and passengers, and in quite a short time she became rich. End of chapter 133 The Old Woman Who Lost Her Dumplings Chapter 134 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 134 The Three Goats Once upon a time there were three goats that were sent to some pasture lands in order to be fattened, and all three happened to be named Grasswind. On their road to pasture there was a bridge across a river which they must pass, and under the bridge lived a gigantic and horrible spirit, whose eyes were as large as two pewter plates, and whose nose was as long as the handle of a hoe. The youngest goat, Grasswind, first came along and stepped upon the bridge. Creak, creak, complained the bridge. Oh, it is only the smallest of the goats named Brasswind, said the goat in a very shrill voice. Then I shall come and fetch you, cried the elf. Nay, do not come for me, for I am still so little, said the goat. Wait a bit, till the second Brasswind comes, for he is much larger than I am. Very well, quoth the elf. After a while, the other goat, Brasswind, came along, and he began to go over the bridge. Creak, creak, cried the bridge again. Who is trampling on my bridge, cried the elf. Oh, it is only the second goat, Brasswind. I am going to the pasture lands to get a little fatter, answered the goat, but in a less soft voice than the first. Then I shall come and fetch you, said the elf. Nay, do not take me. But wait a bit till a large goat Brasswind comes, for he is a great deal bigger than I am. Very well, replied the elf. It was not long before the big goat Brasswind reached the same spot. Creak, creak went the bridge, as if it were going to split. Who comes thundering over my bridge, cried the elf. The big goat Brasswind, said the goat in a gruff voice. Then I shall come and fetch you, cried the elf. Well, come if you like. I've two spears on my head, with which I can easily strike you dead. Yes, come if you like. With the thundering stones I'll shiver to powder your brains and your bones, replied the goat. And butting at the elf, he easily broke every bone in his body, after which he threw him into the river, and followed the other goats to the pasture. And here the goats grew so very, very, very fat that they were not able to come home again and unless they have grown thinner since, they are probably there still. End of chapter 134 The Three Goats
Chapter 135 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 135 The Fox Turned Shepherd. There was once a farmer's wife who rode out to try to find a shepherd. She happened to meet a bear on the way, and the bear inquired whither she was going. "'Oh, I'm going to hire a shepherd,' answered she. "'Will you take me for a shepherd?' asked the bear. "'Yes,' said the woman, "'provided you can call the sheep properly.' "Hoy!" growled the bear. "'No,' said the woman on hearing this, "'I can't hire you.' and on she went. Soon after she met a wolf. "'Where are you going?' asked the wolf. "'Oh, I'm going to hire a shepherd,' answered the woman. "'Will you take me for a shepherd?' asked the wolf. "'Yes, if you can call the sheep properly,' replied the woman. "'Oh!' howled the wolf. "'No, I can't hire you,' said the woman. A little further on she met a fox. "'Where are you going?' he asked. "'Oh, I'm going to hire a shepherd,' answered the woman. "'Will you take me for a shepherd?' asked the fox. "'Yes, provided you can call the sheep properly,' replied the woman. "'Dil dal hollum cried the fox, in a pretty, proper tone. "'Yes, I will hire you,' said the woman, and she took him for a shepherd to watch over the cattle. The first day, on driving the cattle to the meadow, the fox ate up all the goats.' On the second day he made a dainty meal upon the sheep, and on the third day it was the turn for the cows to be eaten. On returning home in the evening, the woman asked him where he had left the cattle. "'Their heads are in the brook, and their bones are in the bushes,' replied the fox. The farmer's wife was just then at the butter tub, busily making butter. Still, she wanted to go and see for herself how things stood. While she went to look, the fox put his head into the butter tub and drank up all the cream. When the woman came back and saw what he had done, she was so exasperated that she seized a clot of cream that still remained in the tub and flung it at the fox, so that it made a spot on his tail. And this is the reason why the fox's tail has a white tip. End of chapter 135 The Fox Turned Shepherd Chapter 136 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 136 The Seven Boys and the Monster. It was a Saturday afternoon, and Casper, Michael, Fritz, and little Bessie were playing before their house, when presently little Hans came running toward them, and breathlessly cried, "'What have I seen? What have I seen?' "'What have you seen, then?' exclaimed all the children in one voice, collecting around him. "'A monster! A frightful monster!' answered Hans, wiping the sweat from his brow. "'You are afraid of your own shadow, fearful Hans,' said Caspar mockingly. "'Perhaps your neighbor's black cat has turned her fiery eyes on you again.' "'I am not afraid of my shadow,' answered Hans angrily. "'Had you only been there, your ridicule would soon have vanished. "'A cat is not a bit like a grasshopper, a fearful great grasshopper, on which one could ride.' At this the children wondered very much and when Hans related that he had seen the monster in the shepherd's hut in the field, that it had horns, and such a voice that the whole hut trembled, they almost believed him. And little Fritz thought, Who knows if it is not one of the rhinoceroses, of which Herr Goldman told us yesterday? Has this monster done you any harm? asked little Bessie. No, answered Hans. When I screamed, it shrank back into its house. "'Then I must go and see it,' said Caspar. "'And if you will all follow, I will go now.' "'The children determined to go, but little Hans said, "'I will not go unarmed.' 
So Casper mounted his horse stick, put on his helmet, and buckled his saber to his side. Michael took his gun, Fritz the drum, and little Hans his lance. You must remain at home, little Bessie, said Hans. I won't bear the blame if the monster hurts you. But I want to go with you, answered little Bessie, almost crying. And if you will not take me, I will tell my mother. Let her go then, said Fritz. But remember, Bessie, you must always keep ten yards behind. Thus, having armed themselves, they took courage, and Caspar thought, Oh, if we could only catch the monster, dead or alive. Ah, here come Peter and Frank and George. They can also go along with us, but they must take the great bean pole out of the garden, that we may be able to attack the monster at a distance. Now the little army set itself in motion. Caspar on Rojo, for so his horse was named, came first as commander. Then came Hans with the spear, Fritz with the drum, Michael with the gun, and lastly Peter, Frank, and George with the pole. Little Bessie came ten yards behind them. All were full of courage, and they sang, The general on his horse comes first, and next the spear and drum, The soldier with his gun, and three armed with a beam pole come. But Bessie marches after all, that unto her no harm may fall. When they came to the little wood through which one must go in order to get to the great meadow where the shepherd's cot stands, Hans cried out all at once, his flag nearly falling from his hands. Did you not hear a noise? Yes, cried all trembling, but Fritz still had courage enough to say, Bessie must remain behind. Then they whispered to one another, The monster, perhaps, has hidden here. But they dared not run away, for fear the monster would fall on them from behind and they resolved to lie on the ground and listen. So they laid down, all apart, and presently they whispered, Hans trembles very much. And after a long time, Fritz asked, Have you heard anything, Caspar? No, he said, and the other said, No. And Frank thought, perhaps it was only the wind. At this they took courage, and in order to show that they were not afraid, they sang, O oh, wind in the woods, whistle all day long, we'll whistle as boldly will whistle as strong, and they began to whistle with all their strength against the wind. When they had come out of the woods, they saw the shepherd's hut standing quite alone. In the distance, the sheep were peacefully feeding with their little bells sounding merrily along the meadows. Only an old ram saw the young band of heroes, and it ventured nearer in order to look wonderingly. But Caspar rode against it, brandishing his sword, which made the ram bleat and gallop away. Now is the time, said Caspar. We will first walk three times round the hut, with no one making any noise. Bessie still stops behind, cried Fritz, out of the strength of his love. Once more, I say, exclaimed Caspar loudly and forcefully, no one must make a noise. We will now walk around, and when we are about to attack, Fritz will give the signal with his drum. So they began to walk around the hut and they marched round much oftener than three times, and each time they stopped at the same place. "'We cannot go around any more,' said Caspar. "'We must attack the monster from some place. "'Do you hide first behind the oak tree, one behind another, "'that the monster may not see you? "'I will step on to the wheel there and look in at the window. "'But mind, you are all ready at the first call.' As they hid themselves behind the oak, he walked slowly with drawn sword to the hut, and little Hans whispered behind the tree, If there should be a wolf in the hut, do you remember the story of Little Red Riding Hood? This made them very afraid, and they held on fast to one another. Only Frank dared look out to see how their captain got on. He had arrived at the hut, and having fastened his horse to a stake, he mounted the wheel in order to look through the window. But, what a monster! A great bearded beast with horns sprang with a loud cry at him, and Caspar, pale as death from terror, fell back and could scarcely cry, Help! Help! The monster! As he called out, Franz said, It has a beard and horns and such a voice! And Hans, who stood next to the oak, fell back on the rest, and one after the other they fell to the ground. Fritz picked himself up first, 
and called to Casper from afar. "'Has he eaten you up yet, dear Casper?' "'Who?' cried Casper, springing up. "'Who?' And out of the hut sounded again the cry. It shook the door, and all fell back again. A goat came running up with playful jumps to our heroes. "'Herr Gulman's sick goat!' cried out all, which since the day before yesterday we have not seen in the schoolyard. "'Did I not say so?' cried Casper. "'But, ah, fearful Hans, where is the monster?' "'It must still be within,' protested Hans. "'You also have seen it.' "'We will look again,' cried the enraged Caspar in anger. "'But, as the monster has not eaten the goat, it is no cannibal. "'Just come here and stand around while Hans and I go in. "'And do you hold the bar of the door, that the monster may not come out?' "'All were, in spite of their former terror, become courageous. "'Still Hans would willingly have gone back, if he had not disliked being called Fearful Hans. He placed himself, therefore, at the door, behind Casper, holding his banner before his eyes, and pressing it close to him. But Casper did not remark that Hans had placed himself behind him, and Hans, on the other hand, did not see Casper turn himself angrily and quickly round, the hut being very dark. And it so happened that he overturned Hans and fell over him, the monster the monster cried hans and caspar exclaimed too the monster the monster for each thought that it had overthrown him with the quickness of lightning they sprang up again in order to escape through the door but those outside only held the bar faster with terror and hans and caspar kicked with such violence against the wood that the others cried the monster the monster but this time it was not a goat but the spectre which every one sometimes sees and feels. This our hero Casper very soon found out, and springing up, he stamped thrice on the ground with his foot, and seizing poor Hans by the collar, he shook him angrily and cried out in a voice nearly choking with rage, You are a coward! You are a coward! Dear Casper, let me go! I will not do it again! Hans, you are a coward! cried Caspar, for the third time shaking him. But, as little Hans said, I will certainly show you a monster. And as the others begged for his life, he let him loose, stamped again on the ground, and exclaimed, Oh, I would have commanded a band of heroes. I would have caught the monster and led it in triumph home. But now it is gone, and you are the cause. But meanwhile the goat, which at first had so frightened them, approached again, and performed various playful capers to induce them to play with it. This increased Caspar's rage, who would have seized the animal and beaten it, but it ran back, and then lowered its horns, rushing against Caspar, not very softly. This excited him the more. He made a bold spring, seizing the brute by the hair, and mounted it, in order to better hold it. But, lo, the goat ran wildly away with him, with mad jumps through the woods, past shrieking Bessie, away into the village, where the people pointed their fingers at him mockingly. Where did the goat stop? Caspar, while he lives, will not forget this. It easily found the way to the schoolhouse, where it had once joyfully fed, and flying to the yard where the affrighted dog tried to seize it, it rushed into the school at the principal entrance, and stood suddenly in the schoolroom, where Herr Gulman was correcting the exercises of his scholars. He heard the tremendous noise and outcry, and putting on his spectacles, he discovered all. What further happened I will omit, out of pity for Caspar, who may read this history some time. Only this I must mention, that Herr Gulman made him read and explain on Monday morning, for a religious exercise, the history of David and Goliath, and soon after he unwillingly related the story of the seven Swabians, who allowed themselves to be conquered by a hare and at that seven little boys blushed very deeply. I believe, however, that seven times seventy and seven little boys would have blushed at this story I have just told, if it had happened to them. End of chapter 136 of Tales of Laughter The Seven Boys and the Monster Chapter 137 of Tales of Laughter 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 137. The Story of Little Black Mingo by Helen Bannerman. Once upon a time there was a little black girl, and her name was Little Black Mingo. She had no father and mother, so she had to live with a horrid, cross old woman called Black Nogi, who used to scold her every day, and sometimes beat her with a stick, even though she had done nothing naughty. One day Black Nogi called her and said, Take this chatty down to the river and fill it with water, and come back as fast as you can. Quick now! So little Black Mingo took the chatty and ran down to the river as fast as she could, and began to fill it with water. When crack, bang, a horrible big mugger poked its nose up through the bottom of the chatty and said, Ha ha, little Mingo, I am going to eat you up. Little Black Mingo did not say anything. She turned and ran away as fast as ever she could, and the mugger ran after her. But the broken chatty around his neck caught his paws, so he could not overtake her. But when she got back to Black Nogi and told her how the mugger had broken the chatty, Black Nogi was fearfully angry. "'You naughty girl,' she said. "'You have broken the chatty yourself. I have a good mind to beat you.' And if she had not been in such a hurry for the water, she would have beaten her. Then she went and fetched the great big chatty that the doby used to boil the clothes in. "'Take this,' she said. And mind you don't break it, or I will beat you. But I can't carry it when it's full of water, said little black Mingo. You must go twice, and bring it half full each time, said black Nogi. So little black Mingo took the doby's great big chatty and started again to go to the river. But first she went to a little bank above the river, and peeped up and down to see if she could see the old mugger anywhere. But she could not see him for he was hiding under the very bank she was standing on, and though his tail stuck out of the water, she never saw him at all. She would like to have run home, but she was too much afraid that Black Nogi would beat her. So little Black Mingo crept down to the river and began filling the big chatty with water. And while she was filling it, the mugger came creeping softly behind her and caught her by the leg, saying, Ah, little Black Mingo! Now I've got you. And little black Mingo said, Oh, please, don't eat me up, great big mugger. What will you give me if I don't eat you up, said the mugger. But little black Mingo was so poor she had nothing to give. So the mugger caught her in his great cruel mouth and swam away with her to an island in the middle of the river and set her down beside a huge pile of eggs. Those are my eggs, he said. Tomorrow a little mugger will come out of each, and then we will have a great feast, and we will eat you up. Then he waddled off to catch a fish for himself, and left little black Mingo alone beside the big pile of eggs. And little black Mingo sat down on a big stone, and hid her face in her hands, and cried bitterly, because she couldn't swim, and she didn't know how to get away. Presently she heard a queer little squeaking noise that sounded like, Squeak, squeak, squeak! Oh, little black Mingo, help me, or I shall be drowned. She got up and looked to see what was calling, and she saw a bush come floating down the river with something wriggling and scrambling about in it, and as it came near she saw that it was a mongoose that was in the bush. So she waded out as far as she could and caught hold of the bush and pulled it in, and the poor mongoose crawled up her arm, to her shoulder, and she carried him to shore. When they got to shore, the mongoose shook himself, and little black Mingo wrung out her petticoat, and so they both very soon got dry. The mongoose then began to poke around for something to eat, and very soon he found the great pile of mugger's eggs. Oh, joy, said he, what's this? Those are the mugger's eggs, said little black Mingo. I'm not afraid of muggers, said the mongoose, and he sat down and began to crack the eggs and eat the little muggers as they came out, and he threw the shells into the water, 
so that the old mugger could not see that any one had been eating them. But he was careless, and he left one eggshell on the edge, and he was hungry, and he ate so many that the pile got much smaller, and when the old mugger came back he saw at once that some one had been meddling with them. So he ran to little black Mingo, and said, How dare you eat my eggs? Indeed, indeed, I didn't, said little black Mingo. Then who could it have been, said the mugger, and he ran back to the eggs as fast as he could, and, sure enough, when he got back he found the mongoose had eaten a whole lot more. Then he said to himself, I must stay beside my eggs until they are hatched into little muggers, or the mongoose will eat them all. So he curled himself into a ring around the eggs and went to sleep. But while he was asleep the mongoose came to eat some more eggs, and ate as many as he wanted. And when the mugger woke this time, oh, what a rage he was in, for there were only six eggs left. He roared so loud that all the little muggers inside the shells gnashed their teeth and tried to roar too. Then he said, I know what I'll do. I'll fetch little black Mingo's big chatty and cover my eggs with that. Then the mongoose won't be able to get at them. So he swam across to the shore and fetched the doby's big chatty and covered the eggs with it. Now, you wicked little mongoose, come and eat my eggs if you can, he said, and he went off quite proud and happy. By and by the mongoose came back, and he was terribly disappointed when he found the eggs were all covered with the big chatty, so he ran off to little black Mingo and asked her to help him, and little black Mingo came and took the big chatty off the eggs, and the mongoose ate them, every one. Now, he said, there will be no little muggers to make a feast for tomorrow. No, said little black Mingo, but the mugger will eat me all by myself, I'm afraid. No, he won't, said the mongoose, for we will sail away together in the big chatty before he comes back. So he climbed onto the edge of the chatty, and little black Mingo pushed the chatty out into the water, and then she clambered into it and paddled with her two hands as hard as she could and the big chatty just sailed beautifully. So they got across safely, and little black Mingo filled the chatty half full of water and took it on her head, and they went up the bank together. When the mugger came back and found only empty eggshells, he was fearfully angry. He roared and he raged and he howled and he yelled till the whole island shook, and his tears ran down his cheeks and patted on the sand like rain. So he started to chase little black Mingo and the mongoose, and he swam across the river as fast as he could. And when he was halfway across, he saw them landing, and as he landed they hurried over the first ridge. So he raced after them, but they ran, and just before he caught them they got into the house and banged the door in his face. Then they shut all the windows, so he could not get in anywhere. All right, he said. You will have to come out sometime, and then I'll catch you both and eat you up. So he hid behind the back of the house and waited. Now Black Nogi was just coming home from the bazaar with a tin of kerosene on her head and a box of matches in her hand. And when he saw her, the mugger rushed out and gobbled her up, kerosene, tin, matches, and all. When Black Nogi found herself in the mugger's insides, she wanted to see where she was. So she felt for the matchbox and took out a match and lit it. But the mugger's teeth had made holes in the kerosene tin, so that the flame of the match caught the kerosene, and bang! The kerosene exploded and blew the old mugger and black nogi into little bits. At the fearful noise, little black Mingo and the mongoose came running out, and there they found black nogi and the old mugger all blown to bits. So little black Mingo and the mongoose got a nice little house for their very own, and there they lived happily ever after. And little black Mingo got the mugger's head for her seat, and the mongoose got black Nogi's handkerchief for his. But he was so wee that he used to put it on the mugger's nose, and there they sat and had their tea every evening. End of chapter 137 of Tales of Laughter Chapter 138 of Tales of Laughter. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 138. The Cock and the Crested Hen. There was once a cock who had a whole farmyard full of hens to look after and manage, and among them was a tiny little crested hen. She thought she was altogether too grand to be in the company with the other hens, for they looked so old and shabby. She wanted to go out and strut about all by herself so that people could see how fine she was and admire her pretty crest and beautiful plumage. So one day, when all the hens were strutting about on the dust heap, and showing themselves off, and picking and clucking as they were wont to do, this desire seized her, and she began to cry. Cluck, 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 over the fence, cluck, 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 over the fence, and wanted to get away. The cock stretched his neck, and shook his comb and feathers, and cried, Go not there, and all the old hens cackled, Go, 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 go not there. But she set off for all of that, and was not a little proud when she got away, and could go about pluming and showing herself off quite alone. Just then a hawk began to fly around in a circle above her, and all of a sudden he swooped down upon her. The cock, as he stood on the top of the dust heap, stretching his neck and peering first with one eye and then with the other, had long noticed him, and cried with all his might, Come, 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 come and help! Come, come, come and help! till the people came running to see what was the matter. They frightened the hawk, so he let go the hen, and had to be satisfied with her tuft and her finest feathers, which he had plucked from her. And then, you may be sure, she lost no time in running home. She stretched her neck, and tripped along, crying, See, 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 see how I look! See, 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 see how I look! The cock came up to her, in his dignified way, drooping one of his wings, and said, didn't I tell you? From that time the hen did not consider herself too good to be in the company of the old hens on the dust heap. End of chapter 138 The Cock and the Crested Hen Chapter 139 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Dale Grothman Chapter 139 of Tales of Laughter by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith The Old Woman and the Fish There was once upon a time an old woman who lived in a miserable cottage on the brow of a hill overlooking the town. Her husband had been dead for many years, and her children were in service rounded about the parish. So she felt rather lonely and dreary by herself. And otherwise, she was not particularly well off either. But when it has been ordained that one shall live, one cannot think of one's funeral, and so one has to take the world as it is, and still be satisfied. That was about all the old woman could console herself with. But that the road up which she had to carry the pails from the well should be so heavy, and that the axe should have a blunt and rusty edge, so that it was only with greatest difficulty that she could cut the little firewood she had, and that the stuff she was weaving was not sufficient. All this grieved her greatly, and caused her to complain from time to time. One day, when she had pulled the bucket up from the well, she happened to find a small pike in the bucket, which did not at all displease her. Such a fish does not come into my pot every day, she said, and now she could have a really grand dish, she thought. But the fish that she had got this time was no fool, and it had the gift of speech that it had. Let me go, said the fish. The old woman began to stare, you might be sure. Such a fish she had never before seen in this world. Are you so much than other fish, then, she said, and too good to be eaten? Wise is he who does not eat all that he gets hold of, said the fish. Only let me go, and you shall not remain without reward for your trouble. 
I like a fish in a bucket better than all those frisking about free and frolicsome in the lakes, said the old woman. And that one can catch with one hand, one can also carry with one's mouth, she said. That may be, said the fish, but if you do as I tell you, you shall have three wishes. Wish in one fist and pour water in the other, and you'll soon see which you will get filled first, said the woman. Promises are well enough but keeping them is better. And I shan't believe much in you till I have got you in the pot, she said. You should mind that tongue of yours, said the fish, and listen to my words. Wish for three things, and then you'll see what will happen, he said. Well, the old woman knew well enough what she wanted to wish, and there might not be so much danger in trying how far the fish would keep his word, she thought. She then began thinking of the heavy hill up from the well. "'I would wish that the pails could go of themselves to the well and home again,' she said. "'So they shall,' said the fish. Then she thought of the axe and how blunt it was. "'I would wish that whatever I strike shall break right off,' she said. "'So it shall,' said the fish. Then she remembered that the stuff she was weaving was not long enough. I would wish that whatever I pull shall become long, she said. That it shall, said the fish. And now let me down into the well again. Yes, that she would, and all at once the pails begin to scramble up the hill. Dear me, did you ever see anything like it? The old woman became so glad and pleased that she slapped herself across the knees. Crack, crack, it sounded, and then both her legs fell off and she was left sitting on the top of the lid over the well. Now came a change. She began to cry and wail, and the tears started from her eyes, whereupon she started to blow her nose with her apron, and as she tugged at her nose, it grew so long, so long, that it was terrible to see. That is what she got for her wishes. Well, there she sat, and there she no doubt still sits, on the lid of the well, and if you want to know what it is like to have a long nose, you had better go there and ask her, for she can tell you all about it. She can. End of chapter 139 of Tales of Laughter The Old Woman and the Fish Chapter 140 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman The Lad and the Fox There was once upon a time a little lad who was on his way to church, and when he came to a clearing in the forest he caught sight of a fox that was lying on top of a big stone so fast asleep that he did not know the lad had seen him. If I kill that fox, said the lad, taking a heavy stone in his fist, and sell the skin, I shall get money for it, and with that money I shall buy some rye, and that rye I shall sow in my father's cornfield at home. When the people who are on their way to church pass by my field of rye, they'll say, Oh, what splendid rye that lad has got! Then I shall say to them, I say, keep away from my rye. But they won't heed me. Then I shall shout at them, I say, keep away from my rye. But still they won't take any notice of me. Then I shall scream with all my might, keep away from my rye. And then they'll listen to me. But the lad screamed so loudly that the fox woke up and made off at once for the forest, so that the lad did not even get as much as a handful of his hair. No, it's always best to take what you can reach. For the undone deeds you should never screech, as the saying goes. The End of the Lad and the Fox Chapter 141 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 141 
THE OLD WOMAN AND THE TRAMP There was once a tramp who went plodding his way through the forest. The distance between the houses was so great that he had little hope of finding shelter before the night set in. But all of a sudden he saw some lights between the trees. He then discovered a cottage where there was a fire burning on the hearth. How nice it would be to roast oneself before that fire, and to get a bite of something, he thought. So he dragged himself toward the cottage. Just then an old woman came toward him. Good evening, and well met, said the tramp. Good evening, said the woman. Where do you come from? South of the sun and east of the moon, said the tramp. And now I am on the way home again. "'for I have been all over the world "'with the exception of this parish,' he said. "'You must be a great traveller, then,' said the woman. "'What may be your business here?' "'Oh, I want shelter for the night,' he said. "'I thought as much,' said the woman. "'But you may as well get away from here at once, "'for my husband is not home, "'and my place is not an inn,' she said. "'My good woman,' said the tramp, you must not be so cross and hard-hearted, for we are both human beings and should help one another, as it is written. Help one another, said the woman. Help? Did you ever hear such a thing? Who will help me, do you think? I haven't a morsel in the house. No, you'll have to look for quarters elsewhere, she said. But the tramp was like the rest of his kind, and he did not consider himself beaten by the first rebuff. Although the old woman grumbled and complained as much as she could, he was just as persistent as ever, and went on begging and praying like a starved dog, until at last she gave in, and he got permission to lie on the floor for the night. That was very kind, he thought, and he thanked her for it. Better on the floor without sleep than suffering cold in the forest deep, he said, for he was a merry fellow, this tramp, and always ready with a rhyme. When he came into the room he could see that the woman was not so badly off as she had pretended, but she was a greedy and stingy woman of the worst sort, and always complaining and grumbling. He now made himself very agreeable, of course, and asked her in his most insinuating manner for something to eat. "'Where am I going to get it from?' said the woman. "'I haven't tasted a morsel myself the whole day.' But the tramp was a cunning fellow, he was. "'Poor old Granny, you must be starving,' he said. "'Well, well, I suppose I will have to ask you to have something with me, then.' "'Have something with you,' said the woman. "'You don't look as if you could ask anybody to have anything. "'What have you got to offer one, I should like to know?' "'He who far and wide does roam sees many things not known at home, "'and he who many things has seen has wits about him and senses keen.' said the tramp. Better dead than to lose one's head. Lend me a pot, Granny. The old woman now became very inquisitive, as you may have guessed, so she let him have a pot. He filled it with water and put it on the fire, and then he blew with all his might until the fire was burning fiercely all around it. Then he took a four-inch nail from his pocket, turned it three times in his hand, and put it into the pot. The woman stared with all her might. "'What's this going to be?' she asked. "'Nail broth,' said the tramp, and began to stir the water with a porridge stick. "'Nail broth?' asked the woman. "'Yes, nail broth,' said the tramp. The old woman had seen and heard a good deal in her time, but that anybody could make broth with a nail, well, she had never heard the like before. "'That's something for poor people to know,' she said, "'and I should like to learn how to make it.' "'That which is not worth having will always go a-begging,' said the tramp. "'But if she wanted to learn how to make it, "'she had only to watch him,' he said, "'and went on stirring the broth. "'The old woman squatted on the ground, "'her hands clasping her knee, "'and her eyes following his hand as he stirred the broth. "'This generally makes good broth,' he said, but this time it will very likely be rather thin, for I have been making broth the whole week with this same nail. If one only had a handful of sifted oatmeal to put in, that would make it all right. 
he said. But what one has to go without, it's no use thinking more about. And so he stirred the broth again. Well, I think I have a scrap of flour somewhere, said the old woman, and went out to fetch some. And it was both good and fine. The tramp began to put the flour into the broth and went on stirring, while the woman sat staring now at him and then at the pot, until her eyes nearly burst their sockets. This broth would be good enough for company, he said, putting in one handful of flour after another. If I only had a bit of salted beef and a few potatoes to put in it, it would be fit for gentlefolk, however particular they might be, he said. But what one has to go without, it's no use thinking more about. When the old woman really began to think it over, she thought she had some potatoes, and perhaps a bit of beef as well. And these she gave the tramp, who went on stirring, while she sat and stared as hard as ever. This will be grand enough for the best in the land, he said. Well, I never, and just fancy, all with a nail. He was really a wonderful man, that tramp. He could do more than drink a sup and turn the tankard up, he could. If one only had a little barley and a drop of milk, I could ask the king himself to have some of it, he said. For this is what he has every blessed evening. That I know, for I have been in service under the king's cook, he said. Dear me, ask the king to have some. Well, I never, exclaimed the woman, slapping her knees. She was quite awestruck at the tramp and his grand connections. But what one has to go without, it's no use thinking more about, said the tramp. And then she remembered she had a little barley, and as for milk, well, she wasn't quite out of that, she said, for her best cow had just calved, and then she went out to fetch both one and the other. The tramp went on stirring, and the woman sat staring, one moment at him, and the next at the pot. Then all at once the tramp took out the nail. Now it's ready, and now we'll have a good feast, he said. But to this kind of soup the king and queen always take a dram or two, and one sandwich at least. And then they always have a cloth on the table when they eat, he said. But what one has to go without it's no use thinking more about. But by this time the old woman herself had begun to feel quite grand and fine, I can tell you. And if that was all that was wanted to make it just as the king had it, she thought it would be nice to have it exactly the same way for once, and to play at being king and queen with the tramp. She went straight to a cupboard and brought out the brandy bottle, dram glasses, butter, and cheese, smoked beef and veal, until at last the table looked as if it were decked out for company. Never in her life had the old woman had such a grand feast, and never had she tasted such broth. And just fancy, made only with a nail. She was in such a good and merry humor at having learned such an economical way of making broth that she did not know how to make enough of the tramp who had taught her such a useful thing. So they ate and drank, and drank and ate, until they both became tired and sleepy. The tramp was now going to lie down on the floor. But that would not do, thought the old woman. No, that is impossible. Such a grand person must have a bed to lie in, she said. He did not need much pressing. It's just like sweet Christmas time, he said, and a nicer woman I have never come across. Ah, well, happy are they who meet with such good people, he said, and he laid down on the bed and went to sleep. The next morning when he awoke, the first thing he got was coffee and a dram. When he was going, the old woman gave him a bright dollar piece. And thanks, many thanks, for what you have taught me, she said. Now I shall live in comfort, since I have learned how to make broth with a nail. Well, it isn't very difficult if one has something good to add to it, said the tramp as he went his way. The woman stood at the door, staring after him. Such nice people don't grow on every bush, she said. End of chapter 141 The Old Woman and the Tramp End of Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin